Legends. Welcome into the playbook. Hi there. Anybody remember who I am? <laughs> We're glad to be with you. Uh, it has been a little bit of a while, hasn't it? Just a little bit anyway. Um, this is Patriots Playbook Off-Season Edition. And uh, the, the beautiful part about this is, is that during the off-season, well, during the regular season anyway, uh, we um, managed to go weekly. During the off-season, it's monthly. Last month, well, we had a little bit of a conflict uh, with something known as a power outage. Uh, in and around here inside uh, uh, Gillette Stadium, which took out about half of the, the ground floor around here. Won't bore you with the details, but it included this studio. So we were unavailable to, to bring you a program. So we'll we'll make up a program at some point in time, I think, during the course of the off-season shows. Um, so what the hell's going on? <laughs> What's going on? I think, let's see, since I was last in this studio, okay, since I was last in this studio, there's a new head coach. There's a new coaching staff. Uh, quarterback of the last three years is gone. Uh, was it three years? It seemed like three years too many. Ooh, did I say that? Sorry. Um, th no, I didn't. I actually I enjoyed Mac. Uh, I thought he was dealt a raw deal, but that's a conversation maybe for another day. We're kind of by that now. Um, we've had uh, the dynasty. Uh, you know, come out on Apple TV, and I know many of you have seen that. The PU guys have certainly talked about it. Uh, I've got some thoughts on that as well. Uh, we've got a draft that's coming up. The owners' meetings were this week. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. So here's kind of what I thought we would do with this particular program. Uh, first and foremost, we're, we're trying to get a hold of Evan Lazar. Uh, he is at pro, the LSU Pro Day today, uh, conceivably to look at Jaden Daniels and, and maybe some of the receivers that are there at LSU that he's going to throw to. Uh, but at any rate, that's primarily where you know uh, the, the Patriots' focus is going to be, I think we know, uh, at, at quarterback at least um, we think we know. It seems like half the entire, if not the almost the entire offensive coaching staff is at this pro day today. Uh, they'll be at um, Drake May as well, um, and that's tomorrow, I think, right? We, we discussed that, right? Jules is running the controls today. Matt's here kind of overseeing, but Jules is a new member of the team, so we welcome you. Please, you know, call and say hello to Jules before you call and want to yell at me today. Uh, but she's going to answer the phones and run the board today, so that's good. We have, you know, we have new meat I, and new blood in here today, so that's good. Um, all right, so here's the thing. There's so much to get into. Let's just jump in. Let me let you know first and foremost that, you know, uh, in addition to Evan, and we hope to catch up with him from the LSU sidelines just to kind of bring us up to date on things, but I know he's busy, and then he will have his updates for you here on Patriots.com a little bit later on with his observations and such. And, and I'm kind of excited about this because Jaden Daniels is the guy that, if they take a quarterback, that's the guy that I want. That's the guy that I've liked from day one. Haven't liked Caleb Williams. I mean, I, look, uh, Strippers knows. He, he played at OU. Uh, I, I don't – I just – there's just – has nothing to do with his college pedigree before he ended up the last couple of years at USC. It's nothing to do with it. I'm not sold he's the franchise difference maker. And what I saw of LSU and Jaden Daniels last year convinced me that he's got a strong enough arm and enough mobility, or as I like to call it, missability, uh, in the offensive backfield to give the Patriots uh, a, a, a dynamic offensively that they have never had Never had. Now, that, this is the way the modern game is going, okay? Th this is the way the game is going. So I think you need to move that direction because you're used to drop back pocket quarterbacks with some mobility, actually very little mobility. But you got a chance to have one that may have the best mobility I've ever seen in a quarterback. I like Jaden Daniels. I'm not against Drake May. I would prefer one of those two over Caleb Williams. I'd put him third on that list if it were me. But it's not me, as we all know. And, and, and truth be known, and I tweeted this out a little bit earlier, so if you haven't followed on Twitter, uh, do me a flave, huh? And uh, follow me on Twitter, or X, whatever you want to call it. At uh, JR Broadcaster is the follow, okay? Um, and I put out a Twitter poll when I was you know, publicizing the fact that we were going to be here today. I put it out about three hours ago, and it just wrapped up. It just ended, okay? Just ended. Um, and I basically asked, who are you picking? If you could pick today, 
if the draft were today and you were in charge today without knowing anything else that you think you'll know a week from now or two weeks from now or actually four weeks from now when they actually have the NFL draft, uh, who would you select? Would it be quarterback, wide receiver, offensive lineman, or other? And 81% of the poll went with quarterback. So I think I know where our in uh, the rest of the poll was 12% offensive line and only 6.5% wide receiver. 1% is other. I, I, I'm a little surprised by that. I realize, and, and this is one of the things that we've talked about on this show before during the regular season, for those that have listened to the show at all, um, uh, I thought they should have taken an offensive lineman a year ago. That was where I was thinking. And I think we discovered that Clearly, that would have been helpful. It would have been helpful. But it didn't happen. So it's good to know that some others are also thinking. Now, we don't know. I mean, we know Jacoby Brissett is back. We know he's ostensibly the starter in week one this next year, uh, unless, of course, they decide to take quarterback in the top three. And to me, this is not a question. And I've said this in the last you know, a couple of shows during the regular season before we wrapped up in January. That if you're going to take a quarterback at three, that tells me that's a quarterback that's ready to go play pro ball now. This is not one of those bring them along slowly type of things. Mac Jones was taken at 15. He started right away and he led the team to the playoffs. It wasn't Mac's ability or lack of ability that went south. It was his nurturing. It was his coaching. I think we can all admit that. It was. This is one of Bill's great failures late in his tenure as a head coach was what he did uh, and what he allowed to happen to Mac Jones. He's going to have to live with that. I'm sure he'll live with it just fine, and I'm sure Mac will be just fine in time. But even an independent viewer has to look in on that and think, wow, he got done dirty. I think a guy that's going to be taken in the top three of the draft needs to be ready to play. Needs to be ready to play. I don't want to bring him along. I want him to be my starter. Now, if you want Jacoby – to come in, and, and, and he, I, you hear the term bridge quarterback. I, I, I know that bridge quarterback is uh, unfair to Jacoby. You brought him in here to tell him, you the guy, you the man. And he needs to act like he's the man until such a time as someone outplays him. But if you're going to draft a quarterback at three, honestly, you've got an opportunity to take a guy that is going to outplay Jacoby Brissett. Let's face it, he's just got more ability, and there's nothing wrong with that. Jacoby's a great team guy. He was that way when he was here before, and I think most of you are probably aware of that. So I want somebody that I think can come in and be dynamic and can lead a team to a touchdown on an opening drive, which just didn't happen last year until, what, the last week of the year? I mean, come on. you got to have somebody. You, listen, if you got a secret weapon, don't you want to don't you want to spring it on people rather than, oh, let's bring him along, let's pat him on the back, let's make sure he's nice and comfy. Let's make sure he knows how to read defenses. Bull. He knows how to do that. Put him out there. Let's see what he's got. Football players play football. I don't want to rest anybody. I want to play him, especially if they're number one. Jaden Daniels has always been my guy because he's got that unique ability of playmaking as well as a strong arm and the ability to gain yardage with his legs. Now, he's no Mack Truck like what they have in Buffalo at quarterback, but he's fast, quick, moves in and out of the pocket well. We've seen these things, uh, and, and I'm sure many of you have seen a lot of video on him. Uh, that would be my choice if you could go QB. I would also tell you that if I were voting in my own poll, I would have selected WR, I would have selected wide receiver. I am a fan of Marvin Harrison Jr. Always have been, may always be. Because I think that there are good quarterbacks, maybe not great, but good quarterbacks that remain in the draft later on in the, either in the first round or maybe in the top of the second round. I have been a particular fan of Michael Penix. Now, maybe you're not. Maybe you're scared uh, scared of his medicals, which he, by the way, has gotten clearance for, all to my knowledge here. But And, and maybe, you're, maybe you're not entirely enamored with a lefty, because I know a lot of people aren't. i, I got to tell you, what I saw of Michael Penix this year, especially against my alma mater in the 
college football semifinal, uh, it was impressive. Now, he did not have, admittedly, a good game in the national championship game against Michigan. But I'm not a J.J. McCarthy guy either. I think J.J. McCarthy could be a very good backup in the NFL. Is that strong enough for you? And, and I'm hearing all, all these rumors, and I love this time of year. We're a month out from the draft, and, oh, so-and-so is going to take this, and, oh, my God, how's that going to change their, uh, you know, their franchise's future? I, I heard that the, the commanders are going to you – know, they like McCarthy at two. And I'm like, really? Wow. If they want to take him at two, by all means. Now, does that mean he's a flop or a failure? Nope. Maybe they know how to coach the guy up. But based on what we know now – who can help us now? Remember, we're taking a quarterback in the top three, so we want someone that's going to help us now. Uh, I don't want J.J. McCarthy. I, I want a guy that can make plays for me now. And I think the Patriots need that. Look, we all expected when Gerard Mayo came in, and yeah, he misspoke a little bit when he said, yeah, we're going to burn in some cash. Yeah, he misspoke. But I, I, I didn't really see that as he was going to come in and just spend money left and right. I took it as a sign of enthusiasm for building the team. Now, it turns out free agency hasn't quite been the cropper that we thought it was going to be. They made the bid for Calvin Ridley. They didn't get it. Guess his girlfriend likes the South. Good Lord. Do you really want somebody, you know, on your team that has that kind of a mentality? They're afraid of a little cold and a little snow. Hell with them. That's kind of how I look at it. To hell with them. All right, good. Go get your ass beat somewhere else. I'm good with that. Um, would love to have had you. And, and uh, yeah, I understand, you know, uh, mama's always right. Okay? I get it. And so he's got to do what he's got to do. But when it comes to pure football playing, uh, you know, Using the excuse of, I don't want to play in the North, I'm going to play in the South, that's weak. That is weak sauce. <laughs> I don't want a guy like that on my team. I don't. So, eliminating that process out of the way, what are you going to do? That's why I want Marvin Harrison. I'd like to see Marvin Harrison selected. And then I would, you know, either, if you're not too sure about the other quarterbacks, I would think seriously about maybe trading back into the first round or – Based on your reconnaissance of where these other guys are going, take your pick in the second round and take who's there. Now, I know a lot of, a lot of people are not real big fans of Bo Nix at Oregon, but the offense that the guy ran um, is extraordinarily attractive, and I think he could probably handle the intricacies of what the Patriots try to do. Penix is the guy, though. That's the guy. I think he'd be the guy. And that's what, you know, if it were up to me, I'd take a good, hard look at that one. Short of that, you know my wishes, um, I, 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 I would take Jaden Daniels. If they take Drake May, does that mean I'm disappointed? No, not at all. May looks to be a prototypical uh, kind of guy that could fit in seamlessly with what the Patriots want to do. But I fear, and here's what I fear, because he doesn't have that overwhelming – you know, je ne sais quoi. He doesn't have that something-something. You know, he's got a strong arm. He's mobile. He can run. You know, he can throw the short pass. He can. He's accurate. He's just. He's solid in a lot of areas. But there's just nothing that makes your eyeballs bug out. Okay. Um, I fear that the Patriots mentality would be to let's bring this guy along slowly because we we don't want to Mac Jones him. We're gonna turn that into a, an adjective, by the way. You know, we're gonna do that. We're going to turn him into an adjective. He's, you know, when we screw up somebody, we just Mac Jonesed them. I think that's appropriate. Um, but we don't want to Mac Jones the guy. And I'm afraid that we'd baby him too much. And when you baby a player too much, sometimes they don't progress the way that you want them to progress. I got college students, you know, who are taking exams. You know, you know most of you know that uh, if you've listened to the show before, I, I teach – uh, college at Dean College, uh, which is just in nearby Franklin. Uh, we're academic partners with the Patriots. And um, I, I gave an exam earlier today. And, you know, I have, you know, uh, students come in and out. And they're all whiny and wishy-washy and like, oh, I don't know about this one, Professor. Can you help me, Professor? I don't know the answer to this one. Can you give me a hint? I'm like, no. No. We're so we, – we, we, 
we, this is the age of entitlement, and I'm just, I've had it. I don't want to do that anymore. If you don't know it, fine. Take your lumps, learn the answer, and move on. And that's kind of how I view the football playing here. Okay? Take your lumps, gain your experience. Those that came before you did the same damn thing. So let's do that. It's worked for generations. It's worked for eons. Let's do that. Nope. I don't know. Nope. We're too entitling. So I don't want to bring Drake May along. And I'd be afraid that if it were Drake May, they'd try to bring him along. And if we do go and and draft Jaden Daniels, oh, my goodness gracious, really? We're going to bring that guy along with that kind of talent? What, are you nuts? I'm just saying. I'd really like to know how you feel about it. 855-PATS-500. 855-PATS-500. Web radio at patriots.com if you want to go the email route. Email's working. Wow. Not a lot working around here. The studio is still crumbling before our eyes, right, Jules? We're trying to, we're trying to get this thing, you know, rebuilt here. And I think the, uh, the Marine said that the, the rebuild is going to happen sometime midsummer around here. So we're going to actually kind of relocate our studios elsewhere for, oh, I don't know, a month or so while they build this studio back up. But we're going to be on the air. You know, PU will still be here. I'll still be here in July. I always bring my students in, you know, in for pre-draft um, discussion. Uh, and they've been ugh, they've been slam dunks the last couple of years. Done their homework, so I'm proud of them. Um, and then it'll be a whole new batch this year. So we'll have that to look forward to over the summer before we crawl back into new studios before the regular season starts again, you know, in September, which is really cool, something to look forward to. But in the meantime, phones are still working. 855-PATS-500. Web radio at patriots.com. Hit me up on X at JR Broadcaster. Elon, Elon Musk would be proud of me. I finally called it X first rather than Twitter. That's just, you know, you know, when you get to be my age, you, you, you just you kind of get into a, a rhythm and it's real hard to break it sometimes. So, uh, but I know it's, it's okay. It's X. Uh, you can hit me up on X at JR Broadcaster. Uh, you can also hit me up on Facebook. I go old school digital media. And I've got a Facebook page, John Dot Rook, R O O K E. If you have not submitted a friend request, please do so because I keep getting the hell spammed out of me. Okay, and and I will not pay attention to you if I don't know that you're a football fan. I'm just not going to do it. Okay, if you're a football fan, you're a Patriots fan. You know, send me an invite, and that way I can click on your profile and see who you are. And I, that's what I'm going to do. And, you know, it's just the way it is because i got too many people that want to try to pull the wool over my eyes. And, look, um, <laughs> I wasn't born yesterday. I'll just leave it at that, okay? I know what people try to do, or at least most of the time. And yet again, I still make a stupid mistake every now and then because we all do. Sometimes it gets by you. But you can certainly go that route as well because I do like to, you know, uh, engage in conversations. I post a lot of stuff on my Facebook page. I also put some stuff up on IGs. It's also at JR Broadcaster on Instagram. So I hope that you will uh, follow me there as well. And we can have a discourse during the offseason. And we can talk during the shows that we have here. You know, and even if we can't get Evan for a few minutes from the sidelines at LSU today, uh, Mike Reese, the one and only, Reese's Pieces from ESPN, he's going to join us uh, at the top of the next hour. Russell Baxter, uh, who many of you know from, uh, um, you know, gosh, he's been on this program since we start, since we launched this program back in 2001, 2002. And um, uh, Russell is uh, truly the, uh, the, the football guru. He knows more football than any of us have probably forgotten. Uh, mostly with Bleacher Report and some other outlets now. Worked with him for a number of years, for over a decade that I worked at ESPN. And um, Russell's going to join us at the bottom of hour two to kind of go over the new rules and things that the owners went through in their meetings this week. You know, I got some questions. I'm not sure how the kickoff thing is going to work. Um, but and, and, and I think the hip drop tackle being banned, which it was by the owners at the meeting this week, I don't know how the hell they're going to legislate that. What are we doing here? It's, it's, it's going to be subject to an official's opinion? Really? Is that what we're doing? There's, not going to, there's no, I've looked at so much you know, video over the course of the last 24 hours. All of them categorized as hip drop tackles, and I don't think I ever saw a tackle that was like the other. 
Remember the old thing from Sesame Street? Which of these things is not like the other? Okay, they're not, none of them are like the other. None of them. I don't, and, and we're going to ask our officials, these officials, to litigate this? Without going to a monitor? I mean, I guess it probably won't be up for review. Because if we do, games will take five hours. I, it's, it's a disaster. There's a reason why the NFLPA said, hey, we're against this. And it, frankly, I kind of side with the players on this one. I realize that the hip drop can be devastating. That's what put Ramondre Stevenson out for the year last year, just to give you an example. It was a hip drop tackle. You know? Grab the guy around the hips, basically, boom, you just flop. Sometimes the runner or receiver gets their legs caught out from caught underneath them, and this is where you tear things and you twist things and you turn things, and that's what happens. But football is football, for God's sake. We're going to legislate ourselves and rule uh, change ourselves right out of the business of what is a dynamic and physically demanding and violent sport. It's starting already, starting, taking the hip drop out. And the owners were unanimous with this. Guys, you're not going to have football teams in 20 years to worry about it because no one's going to be able to play or no one's going to want to play. Just saying. That's just me. I'm just saying. It's part of the game. And I can't wait, or actually I can, (laughs) but I can't wait to see the referees have fun with this one when the the season starts because it is going to be a cluster bleep. Okay? It just is. 855-PATS-500. I want your thoughts on, on any of these things that we've talked about. And, yeah, I'd like to know the, the question that I asked again at the top of the show and the one that I put out on, on uh, X earlier today was the poll. If you were picking today, who would you pick, quarterback, receiver, lineman, or other? And we'll kind of jump into that. I do have some thoughts that I will share with you a little bit later on, I believe, on um, – uh, on the dynasty, uh, I watched the whole series start to finish. Even watched a couple of episodes over again. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, Jeff Benedict, who, the author of the novel, the dynasty, was with us when the book came out here in the playbook. And a month ago, back right out a month ago, when we were scheduled to do our February show, he was booked ready to go before he did this interview tour. So we would have had him first, and then of course the. Uh, the disaster here at Gillette, which knocked all of our power out and knocked us off the air, and he makes all the rounds. And we were, had him scheduled earlier for today, and then he had to then he had to bug out. So um, you know, he it was his turn to bug out after we bugged out on him a month ago. So it just kind of turned out that way. Uh, and I would tell you that if I had him here on the show, I would ask him why then, as after we've listened to all of this and we've watched all of this and we've heard what people think about it, why is there still an overwhelmingly negative tone? Why are we left with this sour taste in our mouths? Mr. Kraft mentioned it, of course. But you can't really tell me that the Krafts didn't have input here. I mean, my God, did you see the closing credits on the very last episode? Kraft Legacy LLC. You're telling me Mr. Kraft didn't have something to do with that? Really? So he was going to lend his name to some entity and then, I mean... I, look, I think I understand it. I think. What are you saying in there? All right, come on, Matt. Tell me. I opened I'm up. Saying, I don't know how credits work. I know it was at the very end of the credit roll. It was, and I so I don't know what level that means. You know, if it if you if it's less, you start. If you provide less, you start at the top of the credits. I don't mm. know what that means, but the fact that that's there is just because we've provided so much footage. You know, we, over the so, last few years, we've so you, provided plenty so you, of highlights. All right, so you're telling me then Craft Legacy LLC is just a video entity? They formed that LLC in order to provide video to the, the I think filmmakers? it's just some legalese thing that you have to throw on there in order to use stuff from this company. Well, but... If it's got an LLC, then it was a, it's a limited partnership. It's a yeah, corporation. I also don't know anything about that kind of stuff. Okay. I'm just, so I'm saying that you know there, somebody has to know something. And if it's got his name on it, he had to know they were doing this. Making the documentary? Well, yeah, that, especially, yeah, number yeah. one. But number two— It was they, in Apple's hands the whole time. I don't I, think I'm he just, was screening I, it. I, as I the, find the it really, way. really difficult to believe that he didn't know, you know what line of questioning would be used. You know, he came out and Mr. Kraft said earlier this week at the owners' meetings, he said that, um, you know, he was disappointed to see that guys like uh, Devin McCourty and Rodney Harrison were disappointed in it because they thought it had extraordinarily negative overtones. 
And he said, yeah, even myself, I didn't realize it was going to go that negative. Well, okay. Then with your name on the dock, you should have had more say so. And I think that's the part that we're having a problem with here because I think the assumption is is that he knew exactly what he was doing, that this was a uh, a slam job on Bill Belichick. And if you looked at it and you even try to consider I, I you want a great example? My 85-year-old father, okay? My 85-year-old father watched it cuz he knows I work for the Patriots, right? He goes, "Why they take it so tough on Bill Belichick? Didn't he win like six Super Bowls?" <laughs> ba bang. Yeah. That's the director's choice. Okay. so Trying the, to draw up drama for so, his so, so then the director made a conscious choice to go for negative. Three years ago. Yes, he did. Okay. Well, that's what I wanted to ask Jeff about. Why? There's I tried to get the director on today as well. You tried to get him too. Okay. Yeah, I know. Well, it's because I think they're probably tired of talking about it because that's the only thing left to talk about. Right? They don't want to face the music. Hey, guys, we went the way we did. Okay. But why didn't you include the 21-game win streak? Why didn't you include, you know, three out of four Super Bowls? Why? I mean, they almost ignored, what was it, 36, 39, 39, they almost ignored it completely. I mean, really? All of this stuff goes on. They ignored tw- Teddy Stroke. Yeah. That's not a story. I mean, I, I, I understand the sensationalism behind Aaron Hernandez. I get that. I get, believe me, I get that. But. Teddy Bruschi recovering from a stroke to get back on the field? That's not a story? No, instead we're going to talk about a guy who murdered somebody. I think we find room for both. I, to me, that, that would have been, as an executive producer, and this is one question, another question, I would have asked Jeff Benedict, why no Teddy Bruschi? You're telling me the guy recovering from a stroke who returns to play in the NFL? Is not worthy of 10 seconds of your time? Come on. Didn't fit the Hollywood aspect of it. Well, there you go. That's exactly right. And maybe that's the part that, you know, Mr. Kraft didn't really have control of or Mr. Kraft didn't really realize was coming. I'll allow for that, I suppose. But when you put your name on something, I think you need to know a little more than just, eh, well, eh, eh. I mean, if my name were on it, I'd want to know about it. That's all I know. And I think most people kind of feel like that. I think I'd want to have at least a little bit of an oversight over it. I don't think I would tell anybody how to do their job. I just want to know what's going on. Because in this particular instance, that, that's a situation where you might want to do a little damage control before the damn thing comes out. Because it seems like now that's all anybody's doing is damage control over the dynasty. This is supposed to have been, I thought, at least initially, and after reading Jeff's book, I thought this was really going to be a, 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 a more of a feel-good type of piece for Patriots fans to celebrate. Because we're not going to see the kind of, you know, dominance on the field like the Patriots put forth over the last 20 years. We're not going to see that again, probably in our lifetimes. That's with all due respect to the current Kansas City Chiefs. What they've done over the last five years has been fantastic. Now do it for 15 more. <laughs> do it for 15 more that, at that pace, at that kind of regularity. And guess what? Okay, then you, you've got, you can be right there with New England. That's how I look at it. Anybody else share those sentiments? All right, I kind of gave you a little sneak preview of what I want to talk about, you know, the dynasty anyway. But, you know, that stuff is also come and gone. But I'm, I'm here because we haven't been here since January. So 855-PATS-500, 855-PATS-500. All right, who's on line one, Jules? Eldred is on line one. Eldred, my man, I'm going to let you lead it off. How you doing, my friend? You got him up? Is he potted up? Yeah, I'm up. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you now. How you okay, doing? How you doing, Mr. Legend? Everything's good, brother. How's it going? How's how's uh, how's the truck driving today? Uh, I'm off today. I, uh, I'm enjoying the day off. You know, it's raining like crazy here. Good for you. But I'm enjoying it. Good yeah. for you. Good for you. Uh, All right. So I know you got a lot on your dynasty. plate. What's up? Oh, yes, sir. You know what? Get, first thing be the dynasty. Okay. Even though I slam Bill a bunch for the GM. Yep. I'm with Marvin Harrison. I didn't like the way they played it, you know. You know, all that I hated him about was this GMing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not building a team the way it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. And helping Brady out in his last years, you know, we had three more Super Bowls. Yeah. That's the only thing I slammed him about. Yeah. But everything else, you know, I, I didn't like that either. <laughs> and I agree with Marvin Harrison and McCordy. 
Well, I, I have to admit I do too because actually I think I got through number five, and I and I and I turned to Miss Robin and I said, "This isn't going to go very well for these guys, is it?" I mean, I, I think we understand the the history here, but this was this was overwhelmingly negative toward Bill. Now, look, you say what you want, and you have several times, and you're not wrong, you know, about Bill's ability to pick players, especially in the last five to ten years. But as far as his ability to yeah. coach, it's really hard to argue when you deliver six championships in an 18-year period. Okay? It's just, and that's what I agree with. Yeah. So that's why, you know, it, we get back to the very beginning of it here. I think the Patriots kind of cut off their nose despite their face on this one. But, hey, sometimes, you know, you need a clean uh, exit, and, and the franchise has to turn a different direction, and they chose to do that. It's their right to do that, and I respect that. Yes, to me too. Uh, but Mr. Legend? Yes. You must be listening to me on PU. <laughs> what you say about Marvin Harrison and Penix, I've been saying that for two months. Have you? And I get, I've been, uh, ask, him, ask Evan. So, I mean, Evan been going at it back and forth with, with uh, Drake May. All right, well then, okay, so, so tell me tell me why Evan doesn't like our suggestion of Penix and, and Marvin Harrison. Because he wants the, the, the Josh Adder number two. And I told him he's Mike Trubisky number two. Yeah. I watch him every year for three years. Every yeah. weekend for three years here. Yeah. We go to a cookout. We have bars. And I'm not a North Carolina fan. I'm a Florida State fan, mm-hmm. you know. But we watch and have people talk. And people keep saying, if y'all get him, y'all going y'all gonna to be worse than when y'all had Mac Jones. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because he can run. He got an arm like a bazooka. But you could throw it through the barn, but first you got to hit the barn. Yeah, true. <laughs> True. Just, you know, bad feet. So, uh, really, so really, you, you you think he has bad feet? Um, a, a bad foot in in in, in the pocket when okay. he's throwing. Okay. When he's throwing, you right. get him off off platform a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. He'll he'll take off and run. Yeah. Before making the play down the field, no, mm-hmm. no, he, he's not accurate. You know, and then like I keep telling, like I keep telling Evan, even the pros that he got sent him a year. Because he's raw. You know, he got a high ceiling, but nobody know where the flow is. Mm-hmm. Now, I can tell you where the flow is. The flow is, you know, out, out of the league in two years. If you keep playing like that. Because mm-hmm. you got three years to get your to build your crap up in college. Mm-hmm. And it's the same way. And everybody, most people in North Carolina would tell you that. And they, a lot of them been calling and telling Evan that. Yep. But Evan, I don't know anybody hate Drake Maple. Why anybody, you know, if he was in the same Outfit that uh, Penix did with Washington, and had them two wide receivers and a get off the line. He probably you'd be talking about. I said no because Penix did it with Indiana with nobody but Penix. Then when he went to Washington, mm-hmm. he, he got a little bit better. You know, uh, some of the injuries got a little bit better. Then he got hurt. You know, at the end of the season in the championship against Michigan. But like I telling telling them, reason why I want Penix, he's playing the same weather that we do. Yeah. And Although, I saw him oh, in that rain against Oregon State. Yeah. And hit his receiver dead in the face, and it was dropping the ball until he got on him. Yeah. Then they started catching. Yeah. And they were fully covered. Yeah. With no wide open receivers, they was covered. And I, he was hitting. I, and and he, 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 got he, a, he, he throws extraordinarily well on the run. Uh, you know, is he a running quarterback? Uh, maybe not no, as much not. As, as Daniels, but I, I would tell you me. that he can certainly, yeah. Before he got hurt, that's true. I mean, didn't he have an ACL tear? I think that's what set him back, right? I think, yeah, I think he had one or two. But, yes, that, that set him back. But he can move in the pocket, and he can run a little bit. Mm-hmm. And he showed that against Michigan. Mm-hmm. But, you know, a couple of times, off, off, uh, like I said, he had an off game. But, but like I told Evan, that's one game you can you always throw up. I could throw seven, eight against Drake May this year and last year and the year before. Yep. Go watch the Clemson game yeah. Yeah. in the rain. Yeah. Go watch the Florida State game we had him last year when we whooped that butt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, he couldn't do nothing. He couldn't run, couldn't throw. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we thrashed that butt, you yeah. know. But um, <laughs> but like I said, you know, Marvin Harrison, I've been watching him for, for a couple of years, too, with Ohio State, especially with C.J. Stroud. He was a freshman. And then last year, mm-hmm. oh, he just took off. With another quarterback, mm-hmm. and that's what I said. Three, Marvin Harris. Two, get Penny. And if I was New England, I would hate to do this, but I would trade Judon to Arizona for for a high number two, 
and get me a left tackle. Yeah, I don't know if I want to get rid of Judon though. We may have to. We may we may disagree on that one. That's, I, that's I think your best asset. That's your I, best I, asset you can trade. Him. I know, but I, I still think though that there's a possibility <laughs> of grabbing somebody short of trading away one of your best defenders uh, that can come in and play left tackle. Yeah, but they, uh, but then again, uh, I, I'm going to throw a fed uh, idea up. Maybe because they got Peters, uh, Peters, whatever his name is, offensive line coach, he's mm-hmm. a good one. Mm-hmm. Maybe he can get somebody off the line that nobody could get last year because they had nobody coaching them. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe that. But but uh, I'm, you know, I, I'm with you. Marvin Harrison at three. But I saw a Mark draft where Oakland moved up at 33 and got Penny. So that means I'll try to move up at 30 and get Penny. Yep. I don't want Bo Nix and Joe McCarthy. You can keep him. Mm-hmm. J.J. McCarthy, you can keep him. Mm-hmm. He, he, he's, he's, he's a mobilized Mac Jones. That's it. Yeah, that might be a little harsh, but okay. All right. I, you know, look, I, I, listen, I, I, I've always thought that trying to take the receiver there – even though you don't have the quarterback, but you have a plan for the quarterback. I always thought that taking the receiver there, look, what's the worst thing going to happen? The worst thing that happens is you don't get the quarterback you want. Well, you've already brought Jacoby Brissett in, and you already think you already think that he's going to end up playing the, you know, the, the season for you, right? So at very, yeah. wor- at very worst, what do you have? Jacoby Brissett throwing to Marvin Harrison Jr., all right? I mean, Eldred, yep, with all due respect, I think eight. you and I could probably throw to Marvin Harrison, and he'd catch the ball, right? I think you would, too. Yeah, yes, so I, I'm just saying uh, you need somebody that's dynamic. You need somebody on the offensive side of the ball that has to be game-planned for. I know you've yes, heard sir. that before, and I know Patriots fans yes, have heard that yes. a lot, especially for the PU guys. We don't have that. This team doesn't have no. that. So we got to go out and find a guy that's going to make the defensive coordinators and other teams go, ooh, you know. Back all right, up. H- yeah, how do we do this? And, and as yes. long as you've got that – that's going to open up another opportunity for somebody else. And I think you're okay with, you know, your, your, yeah. Yeah, your B, C, and D choices. I like the pickup of Austin Hooper. I think that's a very good pickup. You know, I like the re-signing, you know. Uh, so, so, I mean, Henry? yes, of, of uh, Henry. So, I'm look, I'm okay with that. Th- that. Those are all as about yeah. as good as you could possibly do at this stage. So, I know that there's a lot of overwhelming, you know, meh. So what you know Neither over over yeah, over the uh, yeah over the uh, the free agency I get that but you know what I, if you if I don't want to overspend either and and here's the other thing and I know it seemed like at least initially it certainly seemed like well all we're doing here in free agency is re-signing our old guys and didn't our old guys stink anyway not exactly and not I, really I, not, well not, not, not when you and, and Doug yeah and, that's what I mean you, there you need your core there is that's some one thing yes, never did. That's right. There is some value to keeping some of these guys around. And that's, to me, where Bill made his biggest slip-ups, not recognizing some of the guys that he could have kept and decided not to for whatever reason, that I don't want to pay him or whatever. And, look, I don't think we'll ever really know who is at the the, 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 the base of the decision to say we're not paying these guys. I don't know if that was Bill doing it on his own or Mr. Kraft telling him you're not doing it. It might have been a little bit of both. Oh, yeah, it might have been. might have been a little but, bit of both. You know what? I just, but you know what I'm happy about, though, Mr. Legend? All right, what? You and PU. It took y'all 15 years to come around what I've been saying from day one. <laughs> out, Eldred, out it hasn't taken it me 15, 15 years. No, it hasn't taken me 15 years. <laughs> now, I can't speak for the other guys. It hasn't taken me 15 years. Come on now. <laughs> well, like I said, I've been saying that for years. You're going to throw me under the bus with all those guys. I'm getting off the bus, okay? <laughs> okay. All okay. right. <laughs> I, I, I give you, I give you that. But me and you've been saying the same thing for this draft. We have Marvin Harrison at three, Penix at two, but move up and get Penix mm-hmm. before before uh, the Vegas does. Mm-hmm. Yep. You That's know, yeah. I think then, like I said, sure. Why not? And you know what? They might end up still doing that after the next couple of days of you know watching these guys throw. I don't know. I don't know. I'm hoping well, that, that Daniel. I hope Daniel's wows him at LSU today. I hope he does. I hope well, he does. See, that's one thing Drake May didn't throw uh, at the combine because he had to, he know he had to come back here and work on his feet and throw. Yeah, right. And he's not like I said he had to do that. That's why he didn't do it at the combine. Right. Because he, he it's, it's drop his uh, stock would drop. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So and I that, you know I don't Evan can't see. I don't blame I don't blame the high the elite guys the guys that are thought to be you know the top ten picks or whatever I don't mind those guys not going to the combine I don't mind it. 
Because, again, all they can do is bring themselves down a level. I would rather keep the mystique yep. about my ability, you know, and if somebody's really interested in me, I want to see them show up, and then I'll show them what they can do or what I can do. So I don't really mind that. The, the, the combine is for, you know, the, the flotsam and jetsam you know, of the rest of the NFL, for guys that want to get into the league. You know, they get to come in with the measurables, and, and there's always a combine, yeah. you know, workout sure. warrior that always, you know, pops and, you know, that makes you, you know, that gets to be the, the special guy or what have you. And, and that's fine. That's what the combine is for. But I don't think there's really much value at all to watching a bunch of guys run in tights. I just don't. I never have. I never will. <laughs> I, I get your point. But, but what do you think about your boy Worthy, though? Four point two one. Well, he's fantastic, but I, there's a problem and with AD and uh, AD Mitchell. Yes, I, I would tell you that as Let far as work. a uh, as far as a potential professional prospect, I like uh, yep. Adonai Mitchell over Xavier Worthy, and Me I'll too. tell you why. Me too. Okay, I like him because he's got better hands. Exactly. And he's bigger. He, he, Worthy is extraordinarily fast, and I would take him. In a minute, if that's the one that's there, I de- I definitely draft him. But the problem is, is that his hands just, you know, it's it's almost like you flip on a switch. Oh, he's got his hands today, great, and he makes great catches. And then other days he drops everything and gets thrown to him. So, uh, but the guy that's exactly. consistent is Adonai Mitchell. And so, you know, and Mitchell's the guy, you know, that started at Georgia, played last year at Texas. You know, he's caught, you know, uh, big passes and big games over the years. And I think, you know, I, I wouldn't know – I don't know if I would really consider him a true one. He might be like a 1A if we're going to go by that moniker. I mean, I don't even know what the hell the difference is between 1 and 1A anymore. But I, I, I kind of get the, the conjecture there. Um, you know, I, he would be a wonderful complement to what the Patriots have. If he's available there somewhere high in the in the second round, then yeah, I think you'd have to look at it uh, very strongly uh, uh, if, if they the decide to take the quarterback. You think he's he going t- in the first? You think he goes in the first? He's going in the first. Okay. Uh, let me see who I thought they got him. It was either Baltimore or it was Dallas? Mm-hmm. But they also show one with, with, with Brian Thomas went to Dallas too. But he's going. But AD going first, and so is Worthy. They got the Chiefs getting worthy at thirty-two. <laughs> yeah, because they're four-two-one-three. Yeah, well, that's it's pretty hard to ignore that. <laughs> I mean, what can you do with four-two-one? Texas, you know, turned him into a, a, a turner, and so why can't he return kicks in the NFL? You know, he I, certainly I they got, he certainly I could think do they're that. Taking him as, as uh, what you call it again? Uh, mm-hmm. as, as the receiver they got get they let get away. You know, oh sure, because he got that speed and that oh, yeah. same yeah the same size. Yeah, yep, yep. yep. Yeah, I think that they definitely could do that. Hey, the guy that I actually like maybe as a pro prospect better than any of them in Texas is uh, Jatavian Sanders, the tight end, J.T. Sanders. Yeah, they were talking about him too. He's a, he's a really good receiver. He's a very good, well, at least what I saw, very good blocker, big, tough guy, breaks tackles. I mean, I remember several times you know, watching him play and thinking, God, that guy looks like uh, you know, Gronk. You know, with his, with his ability to, to break tackles and utilize speed and strength. And I'm like, you know, this kid could develop. This kid could develop. Yeah, could. could be there. And he, He's probably going, what, third round? That's oh, what I heard, yeah. I uh, heard it's definitely, yeah, definitely a day two thing. But I'm, I'm just, you know, still I'm thinking, hey, the guy's there. I mean, I know you realize, you know, you signed, uh, you know, Hooper in free agency and you re-signed Henry. But, I mean. You didn't need another one. Yeah. Yeah. You might need somebody to last you for a while. Yeah, for sure, sure. So I don't think you could go wrong with that either. So I I like those guys okay, and I think they can all play. But if you're going to ask me which one I'd take first, it'd be Mitchell. Me too. But but, uh, I was hoping they they could uh, do something and double dip at receiver because – I, I wish to do well, don't they need to give them off the hands or what? Just just get them out of there. Yeah. Don't they need to? I mean, I wouldn't have paid them that much. No. Yes. Yeah. They they need all the good talent they can get. I just don't know if they're gonna you know you take do? take receiver in, in you know in in the second third round. They got so many other needs that they have to address. I could see them if they don't trade picks you know or trade down or whatever. I could see them taking the quarterback at three overall. I could t- see them taking receiver you know with their first pick in the second round, and then in the third round they're gonna go lineman. Yeah, I thought about that too, but that's, but that, that's why I said uh, with me, I know everybody keeps saying wouldn't do it, but see, the reason why I said about Juna is up in age, you know he'll help you for the re for get started the rebuild, but he won't be there doing the rebuild. Yeah, 
and then you get then you got you already paid uh well you got uh Jennings and then you mm-hmm. got Uchi. Sure. And they're gonna be your outside. Sure, sure, so sure. You gotta train them in the yeah. that's what I'm saying. They're younger and they're gonna be there. Yeah. And then you can get a tackle in that sucker, their left their left tackle mm-hmm. from either Georgia or the one from Washington. Mm-hmm. And then you you got the quarterback, the wide receiver, and the tackle. Were you and happy? You just fill in the rest. Eldred, were you happy with the the re-signings, the guys that they re-signed, and uh, you know the free agents they kept? Uh, no, sir. Uh, 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 let me see. Our guys, yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Hooper, okay. Osborne, you already got too many guys on the inside. Give me somebody on the outside. You got a, a room full of inside guys. Mm-hmm. Just like you got a room full of safety. Which don't make a bit of sense. Yeah. Okay. You know, because somebody you take snaps from somebody. I understand you got to have about ten, or eleven receivers. Somebody gonna get hurt doing whatever. You know. Well, good. Find find somebody you can put on on the practice squad, but not somebody that you pay and you know you got to get some snaps and get some get get play playing time. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Osborne five eleven. I'm not find somebody on the outside. If you can't get nobody. Then then like they said before. Get our guys in the draft and just let them play. Mm-hmm. And don't let them sit like Bill did. Mm-hmm. Put them out on the field and let them learn from there. Because you know you're rebuilding anyway. Yep. So let them learn like everybody else do. And at year two or end of the year, they're showing out. Sure. Then I got the game down. Sure. I got you. I got you. All right, yep. brother. That's what I would do. All right. I'm good with it. You know, the next time we do this show will be the day before the draft. Okay. So I'm sure there's okay. going to be a lot of things change between now and then, and we might even do our own mock draft on the show, you know, next month just to kind of, you know, run through it all and and, and, and see if we can't, um, you know, figure out who instead of what the Patriots might take in that first round, you know? Okay. So, so I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you contribute. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you would anyway. But, <laughs> but, yes. but, you're, but consider this a personal invitation. How's that? All right. I'm glad to take it up. All right. You know, good. And I look for you then. You have a good one, Mr. Legend. Thanks, good buddy. To talk to you. you be safe out there, all right? all right? That's Eldred in North Carolina where he, you know, hits the byways and highways with his 18-wheeler out there. But off today. Uh, who's on uh, line three? Happy birthday, Todd. You got him? I've got him punched up. And is he still there? Todd going once. Todd going twice. Todd. Happy birthday anyway, Todd. All right. Okay. That's all right. I left him on for a little while, but, you know, Eldred was first. I, you know, we go in sequential order. At 508, uh, no, no, nah, we don't want to do the 508 number. Uh, 855-PATS-500. Shows you how long I've been around. Uh, 855-PATS-500 is the toll-free number. It is open. It is available to you. Web radio at patriots.com. Got a few emails that have already come in. I'm going to jump into those as well. Uh, Mike Reese, ESPN, is going to join us here uh, in 13 minutes. We'll jump up on him at the top of the hour and get the latest Pro Day stuff that's coming up. Uh, also get his thoughts and some of the things that have transpired over the course of the last month, six weeks or so since we've had this, this program last. Uh, a reminder. Uh, easy to drink, easy to enjoy. Bud Light, the official beer sponsor of the New England Patriots. And whether you're in the game or betting on the game, you'll need a game plan. DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of the New England Patriots, provides you with everything you need to build your personal betting game plan so you can get in on all the action while practicing safe bets. Visit DraftKings.com. Why did I read that? Something different. Uh, visit DraftKings.com slash responsible dash gaming to learn more about all the safe betting tools DraftKings has to offer. Hope is here, 800-327-5050 or gamblinghelplinema.org. Must be 21 plus. Play it smart from the start. GameSenseMass.com. Physically present in Massachusetts, see DraftKings.com slash responsible dash gaming for details and state-specific responsible gambling resource. All right, so there you go. There's your updates. Um, I, I wanted to jump back in. I'm not sure that we'll get a chance really to talk about this with Mike coming up. So I did want to jump back in for a couple of moments uh, and, and entertain at least um, questions if you have them, uh, reactions if you have them on uh, the dynasty. Um, because I mentioned off the top of the show I was going to give you my thoughts, and then I proceeded to step right into it anyway, which is certainly uh, – 
sometimes my problem. But I'm, I'm not doing it like I hear other people do because I'm listening to Morning Drive Radio the last couple of days, and they're teasing things, right? You know how we tease, uh, you know, hey, this is coming up next, and now we got to take a commercial break to pay our bills, and then we come back, and then we give you that. And that's how they keep you. The art of the tease is how they keep you through the commercial break, keep you from switching channels, right? Why do these people not remember what they tease? They never got to the story. And I sat in my car by myself in my parking lot at school, students staring at me as they walk by, right? Because I'm waiting for them to go to the story that they said they were going to tease, and they never got there. That's a, that's, that's a radio no-no. That's a television no-no. You know? That's just pure stupidity on the part of the host. Uh, it, just, it just irritates the fire out of me when someone says, hey, we're going to do this, and they get you to stick through the commercial break, and then you get through the commercial break, all right, give me what I stuck around for, and they don't give it to you. So that's a cardinal sin. You have a right on this program. If we ever do anything, if we ever go away to take a break, or I ever say at the top of the show we're going to get to this, and I don't get to it, you can call me out. Okay? Absolutely call me out. Maureen is shaking his head. Yep. <laughs> do I do that often? Do I do it often? No, I didn't think I did. I mean, I can understand. I can understand w w once in a while. I mean, uh, I, human. Bring it on if it does happen. Yeah, yeah. You, human mistakes are made, right? But this is repetitive. It's like every day. And I'm like, what the point? I, I don't trust them anymore. And the one thing I want you to be able to do when you listen to this program is trust. Look, I'm giving it to you, you know, straight from the heart and straight from the head. And generally not in that order. I'm a fan like everybody else, but you try to use your head to get in the way of the heart sometimes. So you can look at some things somewhat analytically. Now, are we going to agree on everything? No, no, no. But that's the joy of this. We're not going to agree. In fact, I get great suggestions from people like Eldrin and, and, and Todd and, and, and a lot of others on this program from time to time. Things that I haven't really considered, you know, when I, you know, put the, the, the blinders on and I get thinking one way and then someone throws me something that's going to get around those blinders, I'm like, ooh, I have to think about that. And then I think about it, I might, you know, they, they might get me to come around. That's what I love most about this program because I think most everybody that listens to this show, and I'd say the overwhelming majority of the people that listen to shows like PU and Catch-22 and the other good programs that we have here on Patriots.com Radio, I would tell you that, you know, you guys are smart. You're smart. You're football fans. You know what you like. Many of you know what you're talking about. I like listening to it. I'm sitting, I sit in my office, even on days when I'm not coming into the studio, and I will listen to PU just to hear what the guys are talking about. I respect the heck out of Evan's ability. You know, he's really good at breaking down tape uh, and, and deciphering, you know, what's what. And so I will listen. And that's why I ask him sometimes the tough questions when we, you know, uh, when he appears on this program because he's a regular on the first half hour of this show every uh, every week that we do it as well. And um, but that's that's the role. Believe me, I'd like to get paid to do something like that too. I think that's 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 a great job to have if 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 there's you know uh, uh, a role in it for me. Um, it's just so different right now. We're going through something here that this this franchise hasn't gone through in a quarter century. Um, the Patriots have a, a, a pick in the top five of the NFL draft for the first time in 30 years, which is well in advance of us even doing this kind of programming. So since we've had Playbook and, and Patriots Unfiltered, which used to be PFW in progress and, you know, and Catch-22 and some of the other shows that have kind of come and gone over the years, uh, you know, there's always been one constant, and the constant has been Bill Belichick and, you know, the quote-unquote Patriot way, or at least that version of the Patriot way. Um, whatever you think that Patriot way might be, and that was brought up a few times, I think, in the dynasty, um, subject to opinion. I think the Patriot way, at least to me, has long been uh, uh, sometimes an unfair tag, but it's been a, a tag put on a franchise that um, um, and, and, and a team. Let's put it more specifically to the team. And the franchise then followed it up and picked it up. But it's to a team that embodies 
uh, a mindset that the coach put in place. And then they started having success with it, and then it kind of built from there. And you, you get in like-minded people. And this is where the whole, hey, the free agents with the, with the, the chips on their shoulders came in. And that's where the whole idea of you know, getting bargain basement guys to come in, buy into this mindset, and then voila, all you've got, all of a sudden now you've got a dynasty. And, and teams have tried to replicate this way of doing things you know, for years and haven't quite had the success for one reason or another. Because there has to be one thing common in every instance. When a team is poised to dominate, the one thing that must exist is unselfishness. If you don't have unselfishness, you don't have a chance of having that mindset. You don't have a chance of having the Patriot way or the Chiefs way or the Steelers way or anybody's way. You don't have a chance. you got to have guys that are unselfish. And you know, right off the bat, the most unselfish of all may have been Tom Brady because we know how many times he had his contract reworked and, you know, and took one for the team and what have you, and that's why it was disappointing the way things ended the way they did. And I'm glad that they did explore that a little bit uh, at the end of the dynasty. They should have as much as he's meant to the franchise. And we all know that we're going to have the big party, uh, you know, here for Tom on June the 12th. Uh, details are still to uh, come on that one, but uh, it will be a ticketed event. I would be stunned if we didn't have every ticket gone in this building. There are some other things, of course, that, um, you know, come to mind overall uh, about the dynasty that I think are uh, – worth sort of you know revisiting a bit uh, I am left with an overwhelming sense of disappointment that a lot of the the good stories as we as we kind of started the program with today uh, hit the edit room floor and and that's a little disappointing as a fan because I wanted to relive some of those rather joyous moments that we were all a part of you know I think I heard my voice a couple of times in on the, the introductions and stuff which was cool um, but, you know, just looking at it from a pure football point of view, man, if you're a Patriots fan, you, you wanted to see, you know, all of the Vinatieri kicks. I think we got two of them, right? Uh, you wanted to see uh, all of the wins. You wanted to see all the confetti. You wanted to see all the, you know, the interviews. You wanted to see all the joy. You know, you wanted to see all that stuff, and we didn't get a lot of that. They glossed over a lot of it because of the stories surrounding, I think, Aaron Hernandez, which understandably deserves time. Um, it's, it was an historical story, but as I said off the top of the show, I mean, you're going to do Aaron Hernandez. Why did you not do Teddy Bruschi? I, it's that, that one flabbergasted me. And then, you know, even, even toward the end, you know, I, I realized that, you know, Hey, Tom's departure here was a huge story. And, you know, I thought they danced around it a little bit. Uh, but I also thought that there was some truth, and you could see some emotion in Tom's eyes, and, and uh, um, I, I thought that part was actually played out okay. I just didn't like Bill being cast as the villain. You know, because every movie has to have a hero and a villain, right? Just about. Just about everywhere. Every movie. Some, every movie has got a hero and a villain. And Bill was cast as a villain. And I just, I, I just, hmm, I had a little bit of a problem with that. Did he, was he perfect? No. Did he make some mistakes? Yeah. Did more of those mistakes come at the end of his career than at the beginning of his career? Well, <laughs> yeah. let's ask a Cleveland Brown fan. But I'm just, you know, you get the point. And I just, I, I just, I thought his successes were glossed over. His failures were amplified. And I just didn't. I, I just don't think they treated him properly. I don't. Um, I will always, and as a fan, I'll always be indebted to Coach Belichick for what he brought this region, what he brought this this city, what he brought this area, what he brought these fans, what he brought a a moribund, once moribund, pathetic franchise back in the you know 1960s into the 70s. And I'm not denigrating the players. Okay, I'm not doing that. Um, because I know a lot of those guys, and I've met them at many functions. And, you know, they're NFL players, and I know what NFL players go through 
in order to have success and be successful. And they uh, are unique, special people. You know, you guys know uh, Super Bowl Twenty center Pete Brock. Uh, he's become a good friend of mine over the years. We've worked together, you know, called football games together, you know, on the radio. And, um, you know, and he's told some great stories about him and Hog Hannah lining up together. And, you know, it's – I and, and the team, other than one or two years, and they really didn't have a ton of success. Not the dominant success that this franchise had over a 20-year period, which – is unparalleled in NFL history, and I think we know that. So we're not denigrating people here, but what we are doing is pointing out that, you know, where this franchise came from, especially when it first got into the, 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 the modern-day NFL when they had the merger back in 1970, that there was more, un, more non-success than success. I think we can all admit that. Took this team a while and this organization a while to figure out what that was. Yeah, I probably took different guidance from above, took different ownership, took people who were willing to, you know, at least put out some money to get the stadium built, which they did. And, of course, now the criticism is, well, the crafts aren't doing enough because the NFLPA survey, you know, had the facilities down at the bottom of the heap in the NFL. You know, and that was another story that transpired over the course of the last month that we haven't really had a chance to talk about. And, and, and honestly, I, I'm, a, I'm a little like Mr. Kraft when he answered that question yesterday uh, on Tuesday at the, at the owner's meeting. I'm kind of like, wow, I guess I didn't realize it was as bad as it was. Now, I've seen a lot of great stadiums. I've been to a lot of great stadiums. I've been to a lot of great facilities. I didn't realize that these paled by comparison that badly. You know, as far as some of the other things are concerned, you know, well, the the, pay, the perks that some players and some families get in other franchises, hey, the Patriots can always use an eye-opener. Hey, uh, the Eagles are doing this. The Titans are doing this. Okay, great. We should be doing that, too, for our players or our players' families. Yeah, they should open up their eyes and do that. There shouldn't be any sort of, well, I don't know if we want to pay for that. No, 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 no. You can't do that. You do that, then you, you run the risk of being um, – you, you run the risk <laughs> of being cast aside. This is how you develop relationships with players for the future because if you, they know that this is a place they want to come to, then you're going to have more success in free agency. It was that way when Tom Brady was here at quarterback, when some of the other athletes were here playing, and it's no longer that way. And it's going to take this franchise now a little while to build back up to that level where those types of players want to return to New England. There's no Belichick, there's no Brady, there's no Brewski, there's no Seymour. There's none of those guys that guys want to align with. And you're going to have to build it up. Somebody had to realize that, and I hope that you know they are able to do that before it gets too late. Okay, got it. Mike Reese, of course, as you guys know, covers the uh, NFL and the Patriots very well for ESPN and ESPN.com. He's kind enough to give us a little time here today in the playbook. Michael, how are you, sir? John, I am doing great. Uh, back from Orlando in the NFL annual meeting. Right. And I was just listening as you were talking uh, prior to me coming on to Matthew Slater. Yep. On Julian Edelman's podcast talking about the same topic yep. and how the players coming into the league these days maybe are a little bit different than when he was coming in and they would revere the veterans in the room like the Rabels, the Brewskis, the Kevin Falks, the uh, Rodney Harrison's and that it's a little different now. It's a lot different now. And I think this is part of the problem in this turning of the page, you know, in Patriots history from the Bill Belichick era to the Gerard Mayo and beyond era. Players are different. For whatever reason, you can agree with it or disagree with it or say they're entitled or whatever you want, but players are different. And if you're going to win in this era like you have won in previous eras, you have to do the adjusting. The players don't. And it's so interesting, John, to put it into words. I'm literally at this point of this podcast. Matthew Slater said it's about emotional, and I believe he used the words emotional intelligence and relational. And so... The idea would be when Matthew Slater came in the league in 2008, they would just follow. They wouldn't ask any questions. Now players are a little more curious of the why. Mm -hmm. They want to feel like they're a partner in yeah. what they're, you know, in what's going on. So yeah. um, to me, that's a little bit of, of where we're at with the Patriots and with Gerard Mayo taking over as head coach, because I think Robert Kraft feels like 
he's the right coach to sort of connect with this new generation of players. You know, I think that maybe uh, there are, are, are many of us that thought that that could be a possibility, uh, obviously, and we started surmising that a year ago when he was named the de facto coach in waiting. Uh, so, uh, you know, and we didn't really know whether or not that would come to fruition, even though it did. But, I, you know, you need somebody who can relate to the present day player. And, and, it should, it can't, and I think that's part of the reason why Bill had a hard time making these connections late in his career, uh, and why well if this guy isn't going to play, then let's just get rid of him. And you know, you're getting rid of completely good players. They're going off, and they're still having success. Other players, which really hadn't happened all that often, uh, we've seen that you know that he had a, a real penchant for knowing when to let go of a player, and that seemed to have slipped a little bit amongst other things. And plus the idea behind, you know, not holding on to the players that you draft and you nurture and letting them go after just one contract, I mean, that just completely, you know, that that blows things up, which is why I think we heard from Gerard and why this team has shown already over the last month or so that they wanted to start rebuilding by re-signing the guys that they feel can be a part of whatever foundation they build here. So, it might be unspectacular to me and to you and to fans and everybody else in terms of the people they signed, but I understand the philosophy here. You, you, you can't, it's really hard to build a house without the foundation. Yeah, I think it's well said, John. And, and my view of it from a Patriots perspective entering free agency was that they have a lot of holes to fill. Their best players had, or a lot of their best players had contracts that were expiring. And if they didn't re-sign them, they would have even more holes to fill than they already had. Yeah, and plus they'd be out more money. They'd be out more money. Yeah, and yeah, That's right, John. And so I feel like they've had to work hard to just remain in neutral. Yeah. And to your point that I heard you say, it's going to take a little bit more time to keep building this up. And I just wanted to add one other thing on Bill Belichick. Sure. I have so much respect for him. I feel like, John, he might have figured it out as time passed that mm-hmm. maybe he needed to change his approach, mm-hmm. but maybe it had just gotten to the point where a fresh start was best for both sides in that situation. Mike, I think that is hitting the proverbial nail on the head. That's exactly what happened. You know, he's like, you know, yeah, I could probably change, but, you know, I'm not sure that, you know, I'm sure there was reluctance for him to change because this is what he's always done. It, it's what it's, 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 it's who he's been. And he's had great success with it. I mean, I, I'll give you, you – know, I'm not comparing yeah. myself to him in any form of way. But, you know, about 20 years ago uh, – 10 years ago, let's say about 10 years ago, when I changed schools where I teach, okay, I knew right then and there that if I was going to continue teaching young people, that I had to learn to adapt with the technology and the way young people reacted to that technology and to your teachings. No longer what I taught back in the early 2000s was going to be effective in 2013 or 2014. And so I made a decision. I got to change. I don't think yeah. Bill. I don't think Bill ever arrived at that. I mean, he's like, yeah, well, you know, uh, players are players. Okay, I think that's his general attitude. And so I mm-hmm. think that's why the fresh start was needed, not through any fault of his, but because frankly, he doesn't see what he needed to see. And I don't think he would have ever gotten there. I'm not sure he would have. And I think that's why and, this is probably the best way that it turned out. And and it's. It, it, It's interesting, John, because I feel like in a lot of ways, Bill had adapted in different areas, but sometimes all of us need to step back, get away from the daily grind, assess, so we can move forward and and, and correct some of those areas. And I think, as I think about him, see, to me, it's a shame that he's not in the league this year. Like, the NFL is better with Bill Belichick in it. Oh, no doubt. Um, But but I I look at it this way, John. I'm like, he can now take this year to to have conversations like you and me are having right now, see ways that he can sort of evolve and come back and maybe bridge that gap going forward. Does he want to come back, though, and evolve at age 72? I think he does. You really do? I think he wants to come back, get that coaching record, and I think this is what he does. He loves to coach. Yeah. Um, and, and I will say, John, another – I mean, I find this as I get close to 50. As we get older, it is hard to change and get out of your ways, but I just would never bet against him. Dude, you're getting close to 50? How about that, John? <laughs> wow. All right. Well, when you catch up to me, let me know, okay? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> you know what? I hope he does come back, you know, because he wants to. I've always thought he wanted that record. I've always thought that that record meant yeah. something to him because he's a true historian of the game. And that is true history, maybe unmatched history. And I, I've always thought that, which is why I was so disappointed that he wasn't going to be able to get the record as a Patriots head coach. I was pulling for that as a fan, Mike. I, I really was. Yeah. But it's not going to happen. So that alone, if he can find someone to come to a meeting of the minds with you know, and promise him, I'm going to give you all I got for three years to age 75, you know, yeah. th- then, then I think you know, it could still happen. But I hope he gets a chance to, to recharge and do it again. And in addition to that, John, I'll, I'll give you three years. And as I do that, I'll also groom perhaps the, the next, next guy. coach to yeah. succeed me. And I'll set up a structure and a foundation for your organization that can endure long beyond the years that I'm there. Great. And I think if, if he says that, he's going to find takers. There will be some takers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike, I'd be, re- I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you a little, you know, your experiences there at the, at the owners' meetings as well and, and – your reaction to, well, Robert Kraft's reactions, you know, not only to, you know, the dynasty thing that he talked about, but, you know, just the way that, you know, the coaching staff has panned out, uh, the way that free agency panned out. Do you find him, was he contrite? Was he honest? What, what Was he genuine? I, what, was your, what was your overall read on, on Mr. Kraft and his reactions to the questions that were thrown out at him? Yeah, so, so we got about 15 minutes to ask him some questions, John, a bunch right. of reporters. I want to say right. maybe 12 or 12 to 13 of us there. I always appreciate that. Um, and with him and with Gerard Mayo, because I feel like did we learn more about the team, their approach, where they are than the day before? And I felt like we learned a lot about how they view things. And so to me, I guess I would sum it up and say, one, I appreciate the access and two, I appreciate the information as this team moves forward because I'm curious how they feel about this transition, which is a huge one. It's big. Big. No question. It's a huge transition. First time in 25 years there's been a coaching change. First time they've had a top five pick in 30 years. I mean, this is as big a transition as this franchise arguably has ever had. Arguably. That's right. That's right. And, and I think, um, you know, you mentioned the, the dynasty stuff. I wrote on that a little bit, um, you know, and because some of the players that have been involved in the project have expressed disappointment. So I think that's that's part of the story. But Mm -hmm. to me, the bigger part is what are they doing as a team to try to get back to the level of excellence that we were used to the prior two decades? Of course. And I see, right? And it's the draft develop. It's Elliot Wolf. It's Gerard Mayo. It's get a young quarterback, high-end quarterback, and – to hear him talk about that, I felt like we learned a lot more about where they're coming from. All right, so well then, uh, you know, they're they're watching, you know, uh, you know, Daniels from LSU today. They're going to watch Drake May. They're going to consider, I'm sure, a lot of options. Are you leaning one way or another yet on which way you think this team is going? So I, I, I ultimately, if I had to pick right now, John, I think it will be a quarterback, um, unless a team comes in and just blows them away with a trade offer. So to me, those are the two options. And it's really, what, what does Washington do it to? If, yeah. if we have that answer, I'll, I would say I, I feel confident. North Carolina, Drake May, he's the guy that I've sort of circled as the one that might fit the best for him, but I'm, I'm not sure he's going to be there, John. You know? So then it would be a question of, do they want to do Jaden Daniels, J.J. McCarthy, or is the trade down more attractive? Geez, at that stage of the game, I'd be willing to trade down. But, I, that, again, that's just me. I mentioned that at the, at the start of the show. I've always been an advocate, to be quite honest with you. I've always been an advocate of taking the, the bridge quarterback, which in this case is Jacoby Brissett, and rolling with him, go get Marvin Harrison Jr., and then yeah. finding a guy somewhere at the top of the second round and developing. And if it doesn't work out in a year or two, you can always do that over again. But if you've got Jacoby for a year, you know, hopefully you can develop somebody that can be ready to move in and at least be competitive in year two. If you're taking a quarterback in the top yeah. three, Mike, if you're taking a QB, which, again, I will argue they certainly should – at least consider it because they got to have it. Everybody, every competing team, every team that's championship contention has got a guy. The Patriots don't have yeah. a guy. So if you're going to go out and draft a guy, though, why aren't you going to play him? Mm-hmm. What well, if you're going to get a guy at three? You got to play him. And so find the guy that's most ready to play. I mean, yeah. bridge or no bridge, the bridge can also come in and be your backup if the 
if the rookie gets hurt. I mean, because we know that's entirely possible. So I just yeah, I, that that's why I've never thought about oh well let's bring him in and bring him along slowly. No, no, no. You're going to draft a guy at three. He needs to be able to play, and I just man that that's where I and if you don't have the guy at three, then get the receiver. Yeah, you get the receiver. So that's that's kind of what and, I think. And, and I, I I can definitely endorse that uh, thought process. I think to me the thought would be he needs to play when. Like, John, is it opening day or is it halfway through the season? Because I think the part that I've seen over the years is sometimes teams rush these rookie quarterbacks in and it really stunts their development in the big picture. Yeah. And so, you know, so I guess that would be the, the pushback, I would say, is maybe they, they get the quarterback at three and they think he's going in the right direction, but they need a little more time. And Jacoby bridges that gap until whatever, week okay. eight. Week ten, week twelve. I mean, sure. how would you feel about that? Yeah, you no, know, I think I could probably live with that, and and then that's just it, though. Do we want to live with it, or do we want to be happy by it, or happy with it, or yeah. feel competitive with it? And I think that's kind of what we have to determine. I think over the next month or so before we, you know, actually get to draft time. Mike, thanks for the time today, buddy. Really, really appreciate it. John, always great being on with you. Thanks for having me. You got it, Mike Reese, the one and only. <clears throat> and we've uh, we've located Evan Lazar. Okay, so Evan. Uh, specifically, where are you right this moment, and what are you watching? <laughs> I am in a parking lot outside <laughs> of the LSU facility. <laughs> I just walked out of there and uh, said hi to Kevin Falk's uh, plaque uh, hanging on the wall. Nice. And then I took uh, took off. So yeah, we, you know, just wrapped up everything. Spoke to. Jaden Daniels and uh, Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr., Brian Kelly, the head coach at LSU. Yeah. And uh, it was a pretty cool experience. You know, I've been to local pro days, Boston College, things like that. Mm-hmm. No offense to our friends down the street, but right. it's a big, little bit of a, of a different vibe here. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's LSU, and I think we can all realize that the, it's, it's still different planetary, uh, you know, uh, grounds that uh, th- these programs exist on, although we know, uh, you know Billy O.B. is going to do his best to, to bring B.C. up to that level in the SEC. All right, so uh, yeah, that's a really good play-by-play, by the way, so I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> t- tell us what you witnessed, what you saw, you know, what these guys did, and do you think what they saw is enough to sway them toward Jaden Daniels, you know, with the third pick? Yeah, you know, I I think the best thing that I saw out of Jaden Daniels was actually uh, away from the actual drills that he was participating in. Uh, he was really involved with his teammates. Uh, he was really involved uh, with Malik Neighbors in particular, running his 40-yard dash, mm. sprinted down to the other side of the field to greet him because he put down a 4-3-5 in the 40-yard dash, according to the LSU. So, a really impressive number for the mm. LSU wide out there. So I, I really just, I think a lot of what you see in these in-person things, like you can watch the film and watch how guys throw and watch how guys uh, play in game, but you do want to see a little bit about how they carry themselves and uh, how, what they look like with their teammates. You know, I hate to use the old cliches, but you know, do, do, do the teammates go to his birthday party and you know, all, all that kind of stuff. And what kind of guy is he uh, around the, the football facility? I think is big. Uh, when you're talking about the quarterback position in particular and a guy that's going to be a face of your franchise. So I was really impressed by Jaden Daniels uh, overall. I think that, uh, you know, he's someone that teammates do gravitate towards and teammates uh, do follow as a leader, and I think that's important for the Patriots. Yeah, I think we all know that you you, you got to have somebody who's going to be ready to take the arrows when they're being fired at you, and there's going to be plenty of arrows fired at the Patriots because – you know, they were a last-place team last year, and, and, and they've got a ways to go to pass their brethren within the AFC East. And so there's going to be a lot of people watching, and there's going to be people trying to knock them down. And can this new leader, can this new face of the franchise, can he withstand those arrows? And, and to me, I mean, you know, certainly talent, what I saw him play at LSU, and even a little bit before that when he was at Arizona State, uh, you know, I, I saw, you know, the term that I've used with you and I used with those before, I saw that missability. You know, that, that, that ability to make others miss when they go after him, that was remarkable, I thought, for a, a quarterback. And, you know, he's, you know, you don't want your quarterback running all the time, but he can get it for you if he needs it. He's not built like Josh Allen, but he certainly seems tough enough. So, you know, based on these things that we know, is this a guy 
based on what you've already talked about with Gerard and, and the coaching staff, is this a guy that can run a Patriot offense? It's, it's my number one question with him, and he did make some throws from under center today, uh, which is not something he did with any sort of regularity at LSU in right. that spread offense. Right. So he mentioned afterwards that that was a point of emphasis that he wanted to show the footwork and the ability to operate from under center as best as he could in this type of setting. And I, I thought he threw the ball well uh, overall. A couple of misfires, maybe trying to overthrow the ball uh, to show off that arm strength. But in general, I, I think that he can make the throws that they need him to make. And he certainly has a very compact and quick release, which I think is something that uh, the Patriots have mentioned in the past is that something that they would gravitate towards uh, just being able to get the ball out quickly and having that efficient, smooth mechanics. And I, I think that's the one thing that maybe he has over at Drake May right now is that Jaden Daniels is more of a natural, smooth, fluid thrower of the football. Uh, and he doesn't have as many mechanical issues that you might need to work out. It's funny you mentioned the, the running ability. Brian Kelly uh, was asked, what was the number one question that teams have asked you about Jaden Daniels? And he said, will he slide? You know, meaning will he protect himself mm -hmm. uh, from the big hits? Because he has taken quite a few big hits mm -hmm. uh, over his career, and especially last season, trying to get those extra yards. Yeah. So I think that teams have less concerns about can he actually play mentally can you play physically between the lines and and more maybe about self-preservation and coming in at 210 pounds today was another box check uh, that goes towards that as well so you think 210 is 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 sturdy enough to be able to take some pounding well it's definitely better than what i think people were expecting which some people had, thought he was going to come in if he had weighed in at the combine in february sub-200, you know, 190, 195, something mm -hmm. like that, which mm -hmm. would have been a major concern in terms of being able to, you know, be durable and just sustain that, uh, hit those hits. So I think 210 is a good number for him, 6'3", 210. Uh, definitely has the size in terms of the, the height and the, the length and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so I, I think he'll be all right. You know, I think he's a bendy, you know, pliable type of guy, to use an old phrase around here. Yeah. So I, I think that there's some element of that as well that helps him in that respect. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, and, and I think uh, we saw through, you know, some of your uh, your uh, uh, posts and, and, and whatnot that uh, almost half of the, the coaching staff was there, most of it, I assume, offensive, correct? Yeah, so the Patriots had nine people here in total. So they had every important figure in the front office side of things, Elliot Wolf, Alonzo Hines-Smith, Matt Crow, Director of College Scouting Cameron Williams, and then obviously uh, Gerard Mayo was here. But they also had assistant coaches here, Alex Van Pelt, Ben McAdoo, uh, T.C. McCartney, who's the quarterback's coach now. So they had nine people in total, definitely one of the bigger contingents. Jaden Daniels confirmed after – uh, his workout that he'll meet with the Patriots later today and have a sit down with them later today. So uh, they are definitely here in numbers uh, in New England. I, I would say the only other team that maybe had close to the amount of people the Patriots had were the Washington Commanders, which I don't think that's any coincidence that the number two and number three overall teams in the draft are the ones that are here in, in full force. Right. I was just going to say, yeah, they're the two most likely teams to select him, so they probably should have the, the, the bigger number of people there. Um, any sense at all of what, you know, the Patriots brass liked, didn't like? Uh, not, not really. I'm actually interested – going tomorrow to North Carolina. So right. I'm following them to UNC tomorrow to see Drake May. And I think that that will really give us a, a good idea of where we're at once we see both of them in back-to-back -back days. You know, there were a few throws here today from Jaden Daniels, a few misfires, uh, like I said earlier, trying to overthrow the ball a little bit. So I'm curious to see what it looks like tomorrow from Drake May and compare those guys side by side. And, and then maybe we get an idea of where the Patriots are leaning, but I think the one thing that you can take away from New England is, uh, you know, Alonzo Highsmith's role in all this is very interesting. I don't know if people know his name very much, but uh, he's going to be a top personnel executive for the Patriots. Mm -hmm. He's coming from the University of Miami. Uh, he worked with Elliot Wolf in Cleveland. And watching him work the room today uh, was impressive. It seems like every single person in that 
facility, uh, both uh, players on LSU and then also uh, the personnel people here, everybody knows who Alonzo Highsmith is, and he was like holding court the entire time. So had a little chat off to the side with Jaden Daniels as well. So it would be interesting to see how much of a role Highsmith has in all of this. That's really cool to hear, and I've heard that about Alonzo. He's a personable guy. And one of the things that I was talking about a little bit earlier here, Ev, was, uh, you know, hey, this is a little different New England than what we're used to having around here over the last 20, 25 years, that it's not really quite the destination point in the NFL for a lot of players like it used to be five to ten years ago with TB12 at the helm. They need guys like Matt Judon and Alonzo Highsmith, especially from the staff now, to begin selling this place all over again, don't they? Yeah, and I, I definitely think you see that as well with Gerard Mayo, who's a, a, per, a player's coach, a former player himself, and uh, relates a lot to the players. And I think some of the free agents that we've even talked about, uh, or talked to, I should say, like a K.J. Osborne talked last week about how personable of a guy Gerard Mayo was, how well he treated his family uh, when he came to the facility for the first time to sign his contract and things like that. So you want to get those things out there. And I think with Highsmith, too, uh, he's coming right from the college game, right from a big-time college program at Miami. So he knows a lot of these kids from the recruiting trail. He knows a lot of these kids because they played against them or uh, when we get to Miami, you know, obviously he coached them or, or was in the building with them. So I think in a lot of ways uh, he's a very big resource to all of this as someone that came just from the college game and is now coming to the pros. Sure. All right. So next, as you said already, uh, North Carolina tomorrow. Good look at Drake May. Uh, you know, what are your expectations? I mean, two different quarterbacks, but they both can do th- some things that the other can't do. Yeah, I am a little – I guess I'm expecting to see Drake May throw the ball maybe with a little bit more pizzazz, mm-hmm. I guess is the sure. term to use, than what we saw from Jaden Daniels today. What I saw from Jaden Daniels today was a really clean, efficient thrower, uh, but I didn't necessarily see a gaudy arm talent, you know, where you're just like ooh and eyeing over every single throw he's made. He did have one throw where that made me – think oh my god you know a deep corner route where he was rolling to his right and just flicked the wrist and put it right on the sideline it was a really nice throw but i would expect three four five of those types of throws tomorrow from drake may and to see that arm talent and that ability uh, to push the ball down the field with velocity so uh, i'm actually thinking that for these two guys the pro day is a much bigger deal for drake may than it is for Jaden daniels now drake may has to have one of those pro days that people talk about years later like remember that pro day right so if he is going to go as high as number two overall number three overall then i think this is a bigger box to check for drake may because he is touted as the bigger arm more naturally gifted arm talent type of guy okay i I think that's that's fair and and that's kind of what i envision what do you think will end up deciding it ultimately for the patriots and this staff i I still think it's ultimately going to be playing style john like which guy do they feel more comfortable building an offensive round? Uh, which guy do they feel like has the skill set that they want to build an offense around? You know, do they want to be an offense with a truly mobile quarterback, a dual threat quarterback like Jaden Daniels? Both these guys can move around, but Jaden Daniels needs to have his legs be a major part of the equation for him at the next level. Do they want to build an offense like that that might resemble Baltimore or something like along those lines? Or could they go in the other direction of the more traditional, uh, prototypical NFL quarterback from the pocket like a Drake May? I think that that's going to be a big part of it. And then obviously uh, what Washington does at number two is going to be a big part of it as well. So it's not like they get to really make that decision on their own. But I I think the biggest thing is going to be which, which flavor do they want, which type of quarterback do they want, and what kind of offense do they want to be. Yeah, and, and that's that was my next question. I, I honestly don't know that I've been able to get anything. You're around these guys, so I would I would ask you any inclination of which kind of offense that they know they want to be? I do think that there is an inclination that they're going to look a lot like Cleveland did, a lot like Green Bay has over the years, which is going to be a little bit more traditional and is going to be a little bit more pro style uh, than what Jaden Daniels ran here at LSU. Uh, but I don't think it's that he can't do it. I just think that it, it has to be adapted uh, to the way that he plays and the way that he's going to need to win at the next level. I just think if you're looking for an easier one-for-one, one, we're just going to put this guy in there and we're not going to have to tweak many things. 
and that probably does lean things a little bit more towards Drake May, uh, or even I have to mention him, you know, and even a guy like J.J. McCarthy. But at the same time, I, I can't really, you know, envision a world where Jaden Daniels there at three overall, yeah. and they're saying, oh, we just can't take this guy because we can't coach him properly. I, right. I feel like they have to be able to coach a guy that's got this much talent. Sure. All right. So we're going to leave all doors open, in other words, right? Of course. <laughs> Always. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, have have safe travels to North Carolina. Try the barbecue, okay, when you get there. Did you have any, cra- do. Did you have any crawfish in, in Louisiana? Uh, no, but I'm hoping to maybe go out tonight and get some crawfish, maybe some gumbo, you know, have a good time. Well, listen, you can't do any worse than than gumbo and a Jack's beer, so uh, it comes highly recommended. Absolutely. All right, brother. Safe travel. See you when you get back. Absolutely. Anytime, John. Thanks for checking in. Evan Lazar, at EZ Lazar uh, on Twitter, of course, on X and um uh, He's usually he's a regular in the opening hour of the program here every week when we do the show during the regular season, and we're going to try to get him to pop in from time to time during the off-season shows here, like we have today. All right, before we get to you know Mr. Baxter coming up, I did want to uh, mention a couple of emails in here. Um, our friend Howard in Stratford, Connecticut, says, "John, just my stream of consciousness thoughts on the off-season so far." One, love the path that GM Wolf and head coach Mayo are taking. Not running out like drunken sailors and throwing money at every warm body in free agency. I concur. 1A, uh, w- uh, went after Ridley, uh, arguably the best wide receiver in free agency. It didn't work out, so be it. Number two, love the fact that a primary focus is signing their own. Number three, love the talk from the GM Wolf that they are focused on building through the draft. I agree with that. I agree with that. You can build the structure of the house through the draft, but the foundation has to come with taking these guys and then resigning them and creating that foundation. That's the analogy we made earlier, and I would concur. I think that's the proper way to go. Uh, Howard says, number four, if I was the GM, I would trade out of three and pick up extra picks but stay in the top ten and draft a left tackle. Not an exciting or flashy pick, but very necessary for this team. Okay. That would be controversial I'm not sure how many people would agree with you on that one Howard um where do you get the quarterback do you get the quarterback with the early pick in round two then Uh, that's the next question that I would ask you because you got to get the quarterback somewhere you need a quarterback you have to have him you know Jacoby is is good but he's only good for I think a short period of time and that's that's the issue that I think we're, we're we're talking about here uh but some excellent thoughts Excellent thoughts, as always. Uh, Aiden in California. Um, I see the team go one of two ways this season. Bottom out again, but playing well like the first year with Dan Campbell did with the Lions. Or we win the close games we couldn't win last year and be like a seven-win team. Regardless, I feel this year is one off well, is, a one, is a one-off for the reason that it's the first year for everyone and they need to feel everything out. For me, I'm okay with that. Because Rome wasn't built in a day. We need to establish a good foundation and add it from there. On another note, I'm glad for your show because I listen to Boston Radio. Man, oh man, such agendas. <laughs> yeah, that is the truth. If you spend any time listening to Boston Sports Talk Radio, you realize that you can probably go mad. Right, Matt? You could probably go mad. Legitimately, you want to take a straight jacket and, 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 and visit the insane asylum. Uh, if you listen to too much of it, because they're extraordinarily negative. But I think we all know in Boston, if you spend any time here, and I know Patriots fans, you know, whether you've lived here or not, uh, you realize how negative this place can be. And I think that's a byproduct of 86 years of, of, of you know, suffering with the Red Sox before they finally won in 2004. That is our legacy. The 86 years of failure that the Boston Red Sox dealt this area is uh, is a plague that will remain in New England until this generation has perished from the earth. <laughs> yeah, it just we're, that's we're going to be negative. It's just the way it is, and and I would tell you that it's sort of changed itself a little bit, uh, at least in the last. Uh, 15 to 20 years because now that this region has experienced success and been 
called title town and you know all you know with the what the Patriots have done and certainly with what the Red Sox have done and you know even with the the Bruins and Celtics having won one and I know fans are still anticipating the Celtics to you know be able to rack up another one this year but there's an expectation here. And I would tell you that I think fans legitimately feel like they know what it takes to win here. Now that we've seen it, how many championships have we had? Twelve in the last two-plus decades. Twelve professional championships here. That's a lot. We're blessed to have seen that and lived through this kind of an era. But it also means that we kind of know what it takes to, to get a winner. The biggest question, of course, is the one that we really don't know and that we're going to continue to find out over the coming weeks and months is, you know, can this current Patriot staff and this new regime live up to those kind of lofty standards? I think they realize that they've got lofty standards to live up to. I'm excited to see what it might be, but is it really going to be fast enough? Is it going to be quick enough for the majority of fans? Same old, same old, you know, just like Belichick. I'm glad to hear, Aiden, that you're you're willing to sort of let this play out because I think that's going to be a common theme for this year, especially when this team struggles a bit. We don't know how much they'll struggle yet because we're not sure when these games will be played, but you know that will come out here in the next month. But uh, it's probably still going to be a little bit of a of a learning lesson. So you got okay, play away. A real woman could stop you from drinking. It has to be a real big woman. It's time to go around the NFL with football guru Russell Baxter. Now on, your name is Flounder. On Patriots Playbook. Flounder. Always good to catch up with our friend Flounder. Mr. Baxter, how are you, sir? I'm good. Uh, with the uh, third overall, se- with the third overall selection, yep. Rome select Julius Caesar. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was now. Was he the most dominant emperor? You think of the Roman Empire? Um, uh, I, I think he was, but unfortunately, he he wound up hanging out with a lot of backstabbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Badum. <laughs> no well, like, kidding. Speaking of Badum, your poor producer Jules had to bear with one of my dad jokes. Um, five minutes ago, I was waxing poetically about what a great person you were. <laughs> and okay. I told her that I had known you for 30 years. Pretty close. And I yeah. said that was very weird because I was only 31 years old. <laughs> I know, right? I know. And then I got silence, and then she just connected me. Yeah, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> she did. She did. She's 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 fitting right in here, man. She's fitting right in. We're, we're happy to yeah. have her. This is great. Well, you know? I, I think I chased things away. So. No, no, not at all. Not, not all right. at all. I don't think so. So, uh, you know, what I really wanted to kind of chit-chat with you about today was, uh, you know, with the owners' meetings having transpired this week, I kind of wanted to get your overall thoughts over the, the rule changes that are, are coming about, more specifically, or most specifically, what the heck the kickoff rule is going to look like now because – I mean, I saw it in the XFL because I actually, you know, I'm a glutton for punishment. I actually liked the XFL. Uh, I actually liked, uh, you know, um, the USFL because, you know, I worked in the old USFL back in the 1980s, right? So, yeah, I liked all that stuff because I always thought there was a market, a real strong market uh, for, you know, spring football. And so I'm happy to see that they're going to exist with the UFL this year, but they're going to turn that, that kickoff rule into a real thing. Um, and I, I'm kind of like, wow, I don't know. I mean, I understand they're doing it for safety, but I, it's going to take me some getting used to. Do you have any thoughts on it one way or the other? Well, when I, when I saw the, the video and, the, and what the formation looked like, the first thing that popped into my head was that wacky fourth down play by the Indianapolis Colts against the Patriots. <laughs> A number of right. I know you know what I'm talking. Oh yeah, because it was one of the best sports memes ever uh, on, um, on 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 what was then known as Twitter when somebody stuck heads of Beavis and Butthead on those two guys. You know, I thought that was I brilliant. They, I think the Colts were so proud of that that they hung a banner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Oh my God. Yeah, well, I listen, think that's that's pretty good. I, I understand the safety aspect of it and so on, and it remains to be seen what it's going to do. But see, my problem with this constant tweaking is 
you know, we tweak the overtime rule, and we've done that a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Uh, we tweak the Pro Bowl, which I, I know has nothing to do with hanging, and they've completely ruined it. Okay, it was fine what it was. It was a boon to the state of Hawaii, frankly. Mm-hmm. Um, tourist industry, people coming over there, players used to go over there after the season anyway, and now it's become a Ouija board. Okay, <laughs> and. Um, you know, all this speaking, and again, I understand the safety aspect. And I get a little riled up when I hear people say it's flag football and it's this and that. Well, it's flag football. Why don't you go suit up? Okay? Mm-hmm. If no one's, I mean, it's, you know that I've worked with a lot of veteran players in my days at ESPN, also some veteran players when I was at CBS for one year and so on. Yep. You know, the toll that football took on them. And I understand it was their decision, which, you know, no one decides to get hurt. But the wear and tear that the older players took is now why, you know, they finally redid the pension plan with the, with the advent of free agency, mm-hmm. you know. And, 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 and again, I, I get it, but I think it's a little bit of overkill. Now, that being said, let's see it in action. We have seen rules change. And then a year later, unchanged. Mm-hmm. Remember the? Do you remember the lowering of the head of the running back was not permitted anymore? Oh right, yeah, sure, yeah. Did you ever see that in force? No, no, I never saw it in force. It just kind of faded. Away. What happened to that? I, I don't know. Someone looked, you know, lowered their head, looked at the, the rule, and erased it. I guess. <laughs> so. Or they just, or they just said, "This is dumb. I wish we had never thought of this." Let's just quietly hope it goes off into the night. What the hell is this? Well, I think no. that's what they're going to do. And the other thing I want to ask you about, we, we can get back to the kickoff here, but I, just because you brought it up, the other thing that just floored me is the whole, you know, hip drop thing. Because I don't know how the hell, and I agree, it can be a dangerous tackle, but I don't know how they're going to legislate this, Russell. How are they? How are they officials? This is we're talking about a subjective call. Everything that I looked at when when the news came out yesterday, came out Tuesday about this, right? And they were sending out all these examples on video of of drop hip, you know, uh, hip drop tackles. There wasn't one that was like the other. And I'm just like, how are they going to decide what is and what isn't? Every tackle made by a middle linebacker or by a linebacker is going to be a hip drop. Are they going to throw a flag on every play? I just I don't get this. We are asking for real trouble on this one. See, I think what happened here is there was a communication issue. Um, the, the NFL is trying to get more into the hip hop <laughs> aspect, not hip drop. Hip-hop. They're trying they to get into hip hop. And all help <laughs> Oh jeez. Oh, Marine is shaking his head on that Can one, dude. <laughs> God, oh, he's like, okay, I don't think that one worked. Well, I mean, we, had, we had been hair pull for a while. Yep. Okay, which yep. is just allowed. We had the, um, <laughs> and I'm going blank right now, the, the, uh, uh, the, you know, the tackle from pull from behind. Um, the okay. one that into parallel one. Yep. Uh, wait, you're, oh, so you're looking for the player? No, no, I'm looking for the the, 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 the definition of the tackle. Oh, the, the definition lead. of the tackle. What you mean the the not the horse collar um, from behind? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. usually that's that collaring or horse collaring. That's the one that kind of you know has been outlawed. And and frankly, I think players have finally figured that one out. But it's taken them what two or three years to figure that one out. Again, it's 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 hard to what you said was spot on right um, right away. Okay. Yeah. How are they going to continue um, to legislate some of these things at the speed of the game? And we were already talking about every, you know, we talk about officials every week, mm-hmm. okay? And every week it's the, it's the same problem. There are missed calls. Now you're adding more subjectivity, okay? Mm-hmm. You're adding more subjectivity to this, and that is... You're going in the wrong direction. The idea, you know, is, John, you certainly remember a wide receiver or a player catches a football. He doesn't get his two feet down, but the official is allowed to rule that if 
he would have gotten his two feet down. Yeah. Then we're going to call it a cat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Going back to the Paul Warfield, the Lynn Swan days, the just, uh, I'm sorry, uh, John Jefferson. Sure. These guys who levitate it, but sure. now it's more definitive. Um, you've got to get two feet down and the ball can't move when you hit the ground. Right. Okay. I right. get all that. That's great. There's no subjectivity in that. But now we're coming up with stuff where we're, we're giving the referees more responsibility than I think some of them can handle because look at the overall picture where we are with officiating. I got a rule change for you. Why don't you make have some full time officials? Yeah. <laughs> and they can spend all 12 months yeah. figuring out what these rules how they should be to, and how they should be enforced. Yeah, I just – this is going to be a disaster, Russell. I, I I hope it's not. But I just – you know, I can see this from coming. This is the train that's coming – that's barreling down on you, you know, at 200 miles an hour. That's what this is. And it's just going to – and people are going to like, well, you know, you know, and I'm just like, oh, we, saw, I saw this coming because there's going to be so much, you know, I can see coaches and sidelines exploding when somebody actually, you know, you know, a linebacker comes up and makes a tackle and they're going to scream, hip drop, hip drop, hip drop. You didn't flag him, you didn't. and it's just like, well, it wasn't a hip drop. So what the hell is a hip drop? And I don't see this clearing up unless you might have crews that could come out, you know, when they hit the training camps in a little bit. And and just demonstrate this is what you can do, this is what you cannot do, and then send that videotape league wide. And if you do this, you're going to get flagged. If you don't do this, you're not going to get flagged. And there's going to have to be something that definitive for this not to be an utter disaster. And again, I know we're trying to protect players because when you when you do what I term a hip drop you know when the when a, let's just we'll use a linebacker because they're the ones that seem to be most in position to make these kind right. of plays uh and and obviously i think safeties would be as well um that you literally are going to grab a player by the hips and you're going to drop but what that does is it can pin the back or receiver's legs underneath them, and that's where the injuries occur. That's what knocked Ramondre Stevenson out of, for the season last year was a hip drop tackle. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could have said it any better. Uh, the idea that – I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm not even sure how this really passed. Okay? I, but I know what happened. Somebody gets – perturbed um, about something that happened again. And then I go back to the, to the over. Brett Ford didn't get the ball in overtime mm-hmm. in the 2009 NFC title game, so they need to change things. Of course, Brett Ford had the ball in the final minute of regulation and decided to throw it to the New Orleans Saints, but let's not let the facts get in the way of a good story. Mm-hmm. Okay? Yeah. Um, and then we saw it changed again with the Buffalo-Kansas City game. Okay, one or two people. The, I think the NFL overreacts to fans in terms of what they want to see and so on. So a few people complain, and again, th- this is what it looks like on the surface. Um, but I like your thought there, and that's exactly what should happen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it, not an instructional video, a actual demonstration of what you should be doing. Yeah. And not doing. And and players exactly. are still going to be instinctive. They're still going to react and and you know it's so fast and so physical and so, you know, gosh, violent that there right. are going to be tackles that they're going to get away with and they're going to be tackles that look like a hip drop that may not be and they're still right. going to get flagged for it. That's my biggest issue. You know, I just don't <laughs> think you can legislate I don't think you can legislate the violence in the game and I think that's what we're right. doing here. Listen, you can tell a player a hundred times you can't grab somebody by the face mask. Right. Inevitably, your hand's going to wind up in there. Right. Be it accidental or intentional. But a, but a face mask is different, just like a horse collar has become different. It's no, a, no. It's a definitive act. The hip right. drop is vague. Right. No, I, I, I get all that. What I'm saying is no matter how many times you explain to a player that keep your hands away from his head, Keep your hands away from his face mask. Inevitably, it just has, sometimes it happens. It's not even your doing, <laughs> right? Okay, it's just it's instinctive. Not, it moves so right. fast, it's instinctive, and you're going to reach and grab for whatever you can. Right. The game is getting faster, and yet we're not. It's, 
the officiating teams aren't keeping up with the speed. By the right, way, right. a train going 200 miles an hour is only the procedure, by the way. <laughs> yes, yes, that's correct. That's correct. All right, I, I'm sorry I interrupted you on, on, on the kickoff thing. So do you think that this is largely going to be favorable, and have we seen the last of kickoffs being returned for touchdowns? No, I don't think it's going to go over well at all. Okay, and I'm wondering if the NFL, I know they changed the rule, and unless I missed something, what we have seen in recent years, what we used to see, I should say, John, we used to see rules like this experiment within the preseason. Okay? Yeah, 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 as right. As I know there's no experimentation with it. We should really, I guess, probably look at how the XFL handled it last year, and I'm sure somebody has done that. I just didn't watch enough of it to to, to make a, a, a judgment on, on can it work over the long haul within the NFL. So, you know, I guess this is probably better uh, suited for somebody in the XFL. Uh, somebody, hey, uh, Maureen, can you get uh, the rock on the, on, the, on the horn? And Okay, let's see if we can get Dwayne Johnson okay. to talk about that, right? So, I don't know. Go to the source. <laughs> right. Right, because they're the ones that came up with the rule, and you know, it's it's basically uh, you know, you, there's no movement until the ball uh, either gets into the end zone or drops into the receiver's hands. <coughs> Excuse me, and and they're lined I'm, up differently. I'm not just I'm not just saying this because I'm on a Patriots show, but there's two people I really like to get their thoughts on. Okay, Bill Belichick, yeah, and Matthew Slater, yeah. Yeah, Slate's really the one we should talk to. He yeah. might be easier to get right now. Yeah, but put the rock on hold and get Bill and Matt. <laughs> okay, put Slate on the list with the rock, will you, Matt? Okay, yeah, he says yes right away. So, yeah, that, that'll be good. Uh, you're right, because he could probably tell you that. It seems to me that if you do your blocking well enough, because you're, you're fr- coming from a non-running start position, that if your offense, the receiving team, does its job of blocking well enough at the point of impact, that once you get by that scrum at roughly the 20, 25-yard line, wherever it comes, you got a guy, if he's got some speed, he could pin one on you. It does seem like it. So I would answer my own question by saying, no, I don't think initially that this is going to eliminate the kick, you know, the, the kickoff return for a touchdown, but it may take us a while before we get there. I just thought of something a little – it's not crazy, but it, it, first off, it plays on one of my favorite things to attend to every year, and that's the whole thing, enshrinement. Mm-hmm. Okay? So the first game, John, that we're going to see this new rule with the kickoff yep. is obviously the Bears and the Texans who are <clears> going to play in the Hall of Fame. Game, right, 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 right. And who's going into the Hall of Fame this year? Some uh, guy named Devin – Hester. Yeah, Devin Hester, right, sure. That might be, uh, he might get more questions about the new kickoff rule in August than he will about how does it feel to be in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Yep. Speaking of the Hall of Fame, I was very disappointed, as I'm sure a lot of people were, that especially listening to this particular program, but I was very disappointed that Rodney Harrison didn't make the cut. And I'm just curious to know what you think your what your stance is on on Rodney and and should he, you know, should he be you know, should he be in there? I think we can all agree that you know he's he's a viable candidate. Is he what you would consider to be one of the greatest to have played his position? I, I, I think he is, and the NFL, and, I'm sorry, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, yeah, in recent years has, to me, almost made a concerted that more of an effort to get safety into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Uh, we saw Ken Easley a couple of years ago. We saw Cliff Harris um, in, Ray Palomalu, Johnny Schell. Um, you know, we've kind of seen an influx of that safety. Mm-hmm. Uh, along with Rodney Harrison, I would think Darren Woodson is certainly a viable candidate as well. Yep. So um, it, this was a very unusual Hall of Fame class in terms of the modern, uh, John, at least I thought so. You know, I, I was I was surprised that a little surprised Andre Johnson got in. I know he waited up there. Um, I was a little surprised, and I'm not saying there's some surprise they got in, but you look at some of the people that have been waiting a little longer. And I'm not talking about the I'm not talking about the seniors committee, okay? I'm talking about the, the modern day guys. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, I know Patrick Willis waited a little bit as well, but not that long. We're, um, I guess I'm used to seeing guys wait like five, six, seven years. Yeah. You know, a couple of years yeah. ago, we didn't see any first ballot guys right. go in. I mean, I was so nice to him with Antonio Gates in, right. in, sure. in first ballot, considering what he's accomplished as well. So, But I agree with you, with Rodney. I think one day he will get in. By the way, he wore Butler a couple of years ago. There's another safety uh, that went in. So you didn't, see, you didn't see a lot of those guys in the early. I mean, Paul South is the all-time interception leader. Uh, he's in Johnny Robinson from the uh, from the Chiefs, uh, part of that great Super Bowl four defense. I think Rodney's time will come. Yeah, um, and you know, hopefully, and we're seeing the Hall change the rules a little. We have a new president now. You know, he's made a concerted effort to get some of these older players in. I think we're, I think we're due for another, you know, class where maybe you put ten or twenty veterans in or something like that. Uh, like they did with the centennial class. Uh, and, you know, I, I've said this so many times, and it's, it's factual. The NFL, actually, pro football dates back to the late 1800s mm-hmm. when the Cardinals were the uh, first pro franchise, I believe. Mm-hmm. The NFL's been around since 1920. The Pro Football Hall of Fame opened in 1963. Yeah. That's a lot of catching up with this. Yep. Still catching up. I guess the, yeah. the, the last one that, that I would kind of have for you here, Russell, is, you know, uh, Patriots actually, believe it or not, because uh, of the new coaching staff, they get to start OTAs in another week. They're, I think April 8th is the first day uh, that they can actually begin their, you know, um, off-season, you know, uh, practices, uh, which is a little bit more than uh, – a little more of a head start than most teams – get to get to go with as a team that is clearly in transition what what do you feel mm-hmm. like you and I talk from year to year and you've brought up a, a wonderful number over the last few years and I'm sure we'll bring it up when the regular season gets a little closer uh, about teams that have the ability to go from worst to first and we've had several of them reach the postseason or go from being out of the postseason into the postseason and the Patriots are clearly in that position but yeah. what do they have to do in your mind in order to be able to be a worst-to-first candidate this year. I'm not going to put them on the pedestal just yet, but I think there's a lot of expectation around New England just because of what's happened in the franchise's history over the last 25 years, and a lot of people will be watching to see how Gerard Mayo and this new staff can begin to take those first steps. What do you think is most important in being able to turn it around like that that quickly? Well, you know, any coach will tell you the most important thing when it comes to your football team is learning how to beat the teams in your own division. Yeah. And the Patriots did that for an awful long time. Um, and they even beat the Bills last year. They did. You know, one of, the, one of their four wins, two of their four wins, I believe, were in the division. That is correct. And they get swept by Miami. They get really in trouble with Miami. Yep. Uh, you know, and now, in, incredibly, Bill Belichick's last game is a loss to the Jets. Yep. Where, you know, which he, he owned the Jets more than Pan Am. Mm-hmm. So... That that's the bottom line that you've got to do. And the one thing that was impressive about Houston last year, and I, it's hard not to correlate the Texans with the Patriots, mm-hmm. that a former defensive standout of the organization who becomes the head coach, um, you know, those the players that the Texans have signed, John, in the last two years has been incredible. Okay, it's almost like everybody wants to play for D'Amico Ryan. They turned things around. They went from three thirteen and one to winning the division, even won a playoff game. Um, and that's what the Patriots, I think, are trying to emulate. They obviously have to get the quarterback right. That's certainly part of it. Um, but they got to get a lot of other things right. Their defense is still, I think, very, very respectable. And considering they didn't have uh, Matt Chudon and Christian Gonzalez for most of the year, yeah. It, it, that's made even more impressive, okay? But they need to get, you know, they need to, for lack of a better word, modernize that offense. I like the an, uh, Antonio Gibson signing. I thought he was another way to play with Washington. Mm-hmm. I really like the K.J. Osborne signing from the Vikings. Mm-hmm. I think I, I think he was a very – I like the – and you know how I feel about Kendrick Bourne. I was very happy they decided to keep him. Yeah, I, so, well, so good move too. I thought that was very good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and but it also depends on the rest of the division. Miami and Buffalo were in salary cap hell this offseason. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. The Bills have lost a lot of players. The Dolphins have lost a lot of players. The Dolphins have also managed to sign a lot of players. Um, Buffalo's got a lot of. They have eleven picks. Miami doesn't have that many. Um, you know, it's hard to figure out the, the Jets. Although I like what they've done on their offensive line. So priority one is reestablishing a winning culture within the division. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's that, that, that's a place to at least start. And that means at minimum splitting with your divisional yeah. opponents, right? So you can at least get to right. three and three and hopefully have a chance to build from there. Right. Well, I mean, you know, the year before when they, had, when they were eight and nine, they did split yep. with their division opponents. Right. Okay? They, they sure did. They, um, I swept the Jets and uh, I think beat Miami later in the year. I think I don't think Tua Tagalo was playing in film, but a win is a win. Yeah. And so on. So, yeah. you know, it's... it's, it's it's not as you know, this team was flat and lifeless down the stretch for the most part. It didn't really emulate what we've seen for twenty something years mm-hmm. with Bill Belichick. It, it was uh, it was almost a defeated mode, even though they had some close calls. And you know they hung around with uh, Kansas City um, in, in that game and so on. So uh, you know they went to Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh uh, on the on the Thursday night. They wound up in the playoffs. So. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's funny who they wound up getting wins over. Um, but then again, some of their, I mean, that home loss to the Saints was one of the, one of the more embarrassing efforts of the last 20 years. Right. So, right. So, I mean, but again, the Browns were a last place team. They made the playoffs. Mm-hmm. The Texans were a last place team. They won a division title. Um, you can flip things around fairly quickly. You can also go belly up pretty quickly. Remember, yeah. John? The Eagles were in the Super Bowl. Last year they were 10 and 1. And by the end of the year, you, you couldn't even believe they were a playoff team. Yeah, that's true. It can go quickly in a hurry. You just have to hope, at least from New England's perspective, it goes quickly on an upward trajectory, not a downward trajectory. Russell, great to visit with you, even if it's the off season. We'll try to check in with you from time to time, my brother, and uh, have a great spring and summer. And uh, we'll uh, we'll definitely we, we have to figure out a way to, to pull you in studio or get you to Foxborough to come cover a game next year. Uh, I always look forward to seeing if there's a Thursday night home game. That a boy for the Pats. All right. Okay. Well, they'll probably stick them with a Thursday night game because I don't know if they'll be good enough to get on the the schedule for Sunday night or Monday night right off the bat. No, well, <laughs> Sunday is Sunday is tough for me because I I do my power rankings and so on. Right. Uh, but Thursday, you know, it's a hop, skip, and a jump. As they get out there, it's not a hop, skip, and a jump to get out of there. That's a different story. Yeah. Um. But uh, I, the last time I saw you was a Thursday night game they played against the Colts. As a matter of fact, I, I think it was. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. We got to do something about that, man. In the meantime, enjoy the off season and uh, keep footballing. We what twenty nine days until the draft. Love it, love it, love it. We'll catch up after the draft for sure. I'll be interested to get your your thoughts on what how the uh, how the Patriots handle it all. You got it. Thanks, buddy. The one and only Russell Baxter, Bax Football Guru on X, B A X Football Guru, all one word. Uh, he's at ProFootballGuru.com, Bleacher Report, uh, full press coverage. Uh, yeah, he worked at ESPN. He worked at CBS. I mean, geez, all over the place. And those of you that have you know listened to the show at any length over a point in time know that he's been a regular on the show, and he's got a tremendous number of connections. Uh, you know, he's 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 great. He knows a lot of football stuff, as you can obviously tell. Um, Patriots fans, if you want to see Toyota's best offers, including those not seen on TV, go to buyatoyota.com. It's Toyota's official website for deals from the official vehicle of the New England Patriots, Toyota. Let's go places. Our thanks to Russell Baxter. Our thanks to Evan Lazar, live from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where uh, Jaden Daniels and the LSU Tigers pro days today. And our thanks to the one and only Mike Reese from ESPN for joining us. Jules, good job. Way to go. Thanks to Maureen Matt for helping set it up. Our next program, our next Patriots playbook, as we're in monthly off-season mode, will be on April the 24th, and that is the day before the 2024 NFL Draft. So we'll preview the draft. Hopefully we'll know, have some ideas which way they want to go by that point in time. But it'll be the day before the draft. Everybody be in draft mode, and so will we, right here in the playbook.
Thank you for downloading this podcast. Subscribe on Apple, Google Play, and everywhere else you listen. Like the show? Please rate and review us. Listener comments and ratings help keep us high in the podcast rankings so new listeners can find us. Be sure to check Patriots.com for more news and more podcasts.